Okay, here we go. Part 4. The Fort of La Cité. Sergeant Major Von Rumpel climbs a ladder in the dark. He can feel the lymph nodes on either side of his neck compressing his esophagus and trachea, his weight like a rag on the rungs. The two gunners inside the periscope turret watch from beneath the rims with their helmets, not offering help, not saluting. The turret is crowned with a steel dome and is used primarily to range larger guns positioned farther below. It offers views of the sea to the west, the cliffs below all strung with entangling wire and directly across the water, a half mile away, the burning city of St. Malo. Artillery has stopped for the moment, where the pre-dawn fires inside the walls take on a steady middle life and adulthood. The western edge of the city has become a holocaust of crimson and carmine, from which there rise multiple towers of smoke. The largest has curdled into a pillar like the cloud of tephra and ash and steam that billows atop an erupting volcano. From afar, the smoke appears strangely solid, as though carved from luminous wood. All along its perimeter, sparks rise and ash falls and administrative documents flutter, utility plans, purchase orders, tax records. With binoculars, Von Rumpel watches what might be a bat go flaming and careening out over the ramparts. A geyser of sparks erupts deep within a house, electrical transformer, hoarded fuel, or maybe a delayed action bomb, and it looks to him as if lightning lashes the town from within. One of the gunners makes unimaginative comments about the smoke, a dead horse you can see at the base of the wall, the intensity of certain quadrants of fire, as though there are noblemen in the ground stands viewing fortress warfare in the years of the Crusaders. Von Rumpel tugs his collar against the bulges in his throat and tries to swallow. The moon sets and the eastern sky lightens, the hem of night pulling away, taking stars with it one by one until it's only two are left. Vega, maybe, or Venus, he never learned. Church spire is gone, says the second gunner. A day ago, above the zigzag rooftops, the cathedral spire pointed straight up higher than everything else. Not this morning. Soon the sun is above the horizon and the orange of flames gives way to the black of smoke rising along the western walls and blowing like a call across the citadel. Finally, for a few seconds, the smoke parts long enough for Von Rumpel to peer into the serrated maze of the city and pick out what he's looking for. The upper section of a tall house with a broad chimney, two windows visible to glass out, one shutter hanging, three in place. Number four, Rue Vaubreuil, still intact, seconds pass, smoke veils it again. A single airplane tracks across the deepening blue, incredibly high. Von Rumpel retreats down the long ladder into the tunnels of the fort below trying not to limp, not to think of the bulges in his groin. In the underground commissary, men sit against the wall, spitting oatmeal from their upturned helmets. The electric lights cast them into alternating pools of glow and sh glare and shadow. Von Rumpel sits on an ammunition box and eats cheese from a tube. The colonel in charge of defending St. Malo has made speeches to these men, speeches about valor, about how any hour the Ermin Goring division will break the American line at Avranches. How reinforcements will pour in from Italy and possibly Belgium, tanks and stukas, truckloads of 50mm mortars. How the people of Berlin believe in them like a nun believes in God. How no one will abandon his post, and if he does, he'll be executed as a deserter. But Von Rumpel is thinking now of the vine inside of him. A black vine that has grown branches through his legs and arms, gnawing his abdomen from the inside. Here in this peninsular fortress just outside St. Malo, cut off from the retreating lines. It seems only a matter of time until Canadians and Brits and the bright American eyes of the 83rd Division will be swarming the city, scouring the homes for marauding Huns, doing whatever it is they do when they take prisoners. Only a matter of time until the black vine chokes off his heart. What? says the soldier beside him. Von Rumpel sniffs. I do not say anything. The soldier squints back into the oatmeal in his helmet. Von Rumpel squeezes out the last of the vial, salty cheese, and drops the empty tube between his feet. The house is still there. His army still holds the city. For a few hours, the fires will burn, and then the Germans will swarm like ants back to their positions and fight for another day. He will wait, wait, and wait, and wait, and when the smoke clears, he will go in. <coughs> Atelier de Reparation Burned the engineer squirms in pain, grinding his face into the back of the old and armchair. Something wrong with his leg, and possibly worse with his chest. The radio is hopeless. The power cable has been severed and led to the above ground. Antenna is lost, and Werner cannot, would not be surprised if the selector panel is broken. In the weakening amber, full chimer's field light, he stares at one crushed plug after another. The bombing seems to have destroyed the hearing in his left ear. His right, as far as he can tell, is gradually coming back. Beyond the ringing, he begins to hear. Ticking of fires as they cool, groaning of the hotel above, strange miscellaneous dripping, and Volkheimer as he hacks intermittently, insanely, at the rubble blocking the stairwell. Volkheimer's technique apparently is this. He crouches beneath the buckled ceiling, panting, holding a piece of twisted rebar in one hand. He switches on his flashlight and scans the packed stairwell for anything he might drag out of it. 
memorizing positions. Then he switches off the light to preserve its battery, goes at his task in the darkness. When the light comes back on, the mess of the stairwell looks the same. An impacted welter of metal and brickwork and timber so thick that it's hard to believe twenty men could get through. Please, Volkheimer says. Whether he knows he's saying it aloud or not, Warner cannot say. But Warner hears in his right ear like a distant prayer. Please, please. As though everything in the war to this point was tolerable to 21-year-old Frank Volkheimer, but not this final injustice. The fires above ought to have sucked the last oxygen out of this hole by now. They all should have ex as asphyxiated. Debts paid, accounts settled, and yet they breathe. The three splintered beams in the ceiling hold up God knows what load. Ten tons of carbonized hotel and the corpses of eight anti-aircraft men and untold unexploded ordnance. Maybe Werner for his ten thousand small betrayals and burned for his innumerable crimes and Volkheimer for being the instrument, the executor of the orders, the blade of the Reich. Maybe the three of them have some greater price to pay, some final sentence to be handed down. First a Corsair cellar, built to safeguard gold, weapons and eccentric beekeeping equipment. Then a wine cellar, then a handyman's nook. Atelier de rep reparation, thinks Werner, a chamber in which to make reparations, as appropriate a place as any. Certainly there would be people in the world who believe these three have reparations to make. Two cans. When Maria Laura wakes, this little model house is pinned beneath her chest and she is sweating through her great uncle's coat. Is it dawn? She climbs the ladder and presses her ear to the trap door. No more sirens. Maybe the house is burned to the ground while she slept. Or else she slept through the last hours of the war and the city has been liberated. There could be people in the streets. Volunteers, gendarmes, fire brigades, even Americans. She should go through the trap door and walk out the front door into the onto the roof of Aurel. But what if Germany has held the city? What if Germans are right now marching from house to house, shooting whomever they please? She will wait. At any moment, Etienne could be making his way toward her, fighting with his last breath to reach her. Or he is crouched somewhere, cradling his head, seeing demons. Or he is dead. She tells herself to save the bread, but she is famished, and the loaf is going, getting stale, and before she knows it, she has finished it. If only she had brought her novel down with her. Marie Lourish roves the cellar in her stocking feet. Here's a rolled rug, its hollow... F it's hollow filled with what smell like wood shavings, mice. Here's a crate that contains old papers, antique lamp, Madame Mannix canning supplies, and here at the back of a shelf near the ceiling two small miracles, full cans. Hardly any food remains in the entire kitchen, only cornmeal and a sheaf of lavender and two or three bottles of skunked bourgeoisie. But down here in the cellar, two heavy cans. Peas, beans, corn kernels maybe? Not oil, she prays. Aren't oil cans smaller? When she shakes them, they offer no clue. Marie Laura tries to calculate the chances that one might contain Madame Manic's peaches, the white peaches from Languedoc that she'd buy by the crate and peel and quarter and boil with sugar. The whole kitchen would fill with their smell and color. Marie Laura's figure is sticky with them, a kind of rapture. Two cans Etienne missed. But to raise one's hope is to risk their falling further. Peas or beans, these would be more than welcome. She deposits one can in each pocket of her uncle's coat and checks again for the little house in the pockets of her dress. And check and sits on a trunk and clasps her cane in both hands and tries not to think about her bladder. Once, when she was eight or nine, her father took her to the Pantheon in Paris to describe Foucault's pendulum. Its bob, he said, was a golden sphere shaped like a child's top. It swung from a wire that was 67 meters long because its trajectory changed over time, he explained. It proved beyond all doubt that the earth rotated. But Marie, what Marie Lowell remembered, standing at the rail as it whistled past, was her father saying that Foucault's pendulum would never stop. It would keep swinging, she understood, after she and her father left the Pantheon, after she had fallen asleep that night, after she had forgotten about it and lived her entire life and died. Now it is as if she can hear the pendulum in the air in front of her, that huge golden bob as wide across as a barrel, swinging on and on, never stopping, grooving and regrooving its inhuman truth into the floor. Number 4 Rue Volbrel Ashes, ashes, snow in August. The shelling resumes sporadically after breakfast, and now, around 6 p.m., has ceased. A machine gun fires somewhere, a sound like a chain of beads passing through fingers. Sergeant Major von Rumpel carries a canteen, a half dozen ampules of morphine, and his field pistol. Over the seawall, over the causeway, toward the huge smoldering bulwark of St. Malo, out in the harbor, the jetty has been shattered in multiple places. A half submerged fishing boat drifts stern up. Inside the old city, mountains of stone blocks, sacks, shutters, branches, iron grillwork, and chimney pots fill the rue de Dinan. Smashed flower boxes and the charred window frames and shattered glasses, some buildings still smoke, and though Von Rumpel keeps a damp handkerchief pressed over his mouth and nose, he has to stop several times to gather his breath. Here, a dead horse starting to bloat. Here, a chair upholstered in striped green velvet. Here, the torn shreds of a canopy proclaim a brasserie. 
Curtains swing idly from broken windows in the strange flickering light. They unnerve him. Swallows fly to and fro looking for lost nests and some when very far away might be screaming or might be the wind. The blasts have stripped many shop signs off their brackets and the gibbets hang forsaken. A schnauzer trots after him whining. No one shouts down from a window to warn him away from mines. Indeed, in four blocks he sees only one soul. A woman outside what was the day before. The movie house, dust pan in one hand, broom nowhere to be seen. She looks up at him, dazed. Through an open door behind her, rows of seats have crumpled up beneath great slabs of ceiling. Beyond them, the screens stand unblemished, not even strained by smoke. Shows not till eight, she says in her Breton French, and he nods as he limps past. On the Rue Vorbro, vast quantities of slate tiles have slid off roofs and detonated on the streets. Scraps of burned paper flow overhead. No goals. Even if the house has caught fire, he thinks the diamond will be there. He will pluck it from the ashes like a warm egg. But the tall, slender house remains nearly unscathed. Eleven windows on the facade, most of the glass out. Blue window frames, old granites of grays and tans. Four of its six flower boxes hang on. The mandated list of occupants clings to its front door. M. Etienne Leblanc, age 63. Mel Marie Laure Leblanc, age 16. All the dangers he's willing to endure for the Reich, for himself. No one stops him. Those shells come whistling in. Sometimes the eye of a hurricane is the safest place to be. What they have. When is it day and when night? Time seems better measured by flashes. Volkheimer's field light flickers off, flicks on. Werner watches Volkheimer's ash touch his face in reflected glow. His ministrations as he leans over burned. Drinks says Volkheimer's mouth as he holds his canteen to burn's lips. And shadows lunge across the broken ceiling like a circle of wraths. Wraiths pretend, preparing to feast. Burn twists his face away, panic in his eyes, and tries to examine his leg. The flashlight switches off and the darkness rushes back. In Werner's duffel he had his childhood notebook, his blanket, and dry socks. Three rations. This is all the food they have. Volkheimer has none. Burn has none. They have only two canteens of water, each half empty. Volkheimer's also discovered a bucket of paintbrushes in a corner with some watery sludge in the bottom. But how desperate will they have to become to drink that? Two stick grenades, Model 24s, one in each of the side pockets of Volkheimer's coat. Hollow wood handles in the bottom, high explosive charges, and a steel can on top. Handheld bombs the boys at Schulpforte call potato mashers. Twice already burnt has begged Volkheimer to try one on the impacted mess of the stairwell to see if they can blast their way out. But to use a grenade down here in such close quarters beneath rubble presumably, presumably littered with live 88mm shells would be suicide. Then there's the rifle, Wolkheimer's Volk bolt-action carabiner 98k, loaded with five rounds. Enough, thinks Werner. Plenty. They would need only three, one for each. Sometimes in the darkness, Werner thinks the cellar may have its own faint light, perhaps emanating from the rubble, the space going a bit redder as the August day above them progresses towards dusk. After a while, he is learning. Even total darkness is not quite darkness. More than once, he thinks he can spread his fingers when he passes them in front of his eyes. Werner thinks of his childhood, the skies of coal dust suspended in the air on winter mornings, settling on windsills in the children's cars, ears in their lungs, except down here in this hole. The white dust is the inverse, as if he's trapped in some deep mind that is same, but also the opposite of the one that killed his father. Dark again, light again, Volkheimer's antic ash dusted face materializes in front of Werner, his rank insignia partially torn off one shoulder. With the beam of his field light, he shows Werner that he is holding two bent screwdrivers and a box of electrical fuses. The radio, he says into Werner's good ear. Have you slept at all? Volkheimer turns the light onto his own face. Before we run out of battery, says his mouth. Werner shakes his head. The radio is hopeless. He wants to close his eyes, forget, give up, wait for the rifle barrel to touch his temple. But Volkheimer wants to make an argument that life is worth living. The filaments of the bulb inside his field light glow yellow, weaker already. Volkheimer's illuminated mouth is red against the black blackness. We are running out of time, his lips say. The building groans, Warner sees green grass, crackling fires, sunlight, the gates of a summer state opening wide. When death comes for Burned, it might as well come for him also. Save a second trip. Your sister, says Volkheimer. Think of your sister. Tripwire. Her bladder will not hold much longer. She scales the cellar steps and holds her breaths, and hears nothing for thirty heartbeats. Forty, then she pushes open the trap door and climbs into the kitchen. No one shoots her. She hears no explosions. Marie Lore crunches over the fallen kitchen shelves and crosses into Madame Mannix's tiny apartment, the two cans swinging heavily in her granduncle's coat, throat stinging, nostrils stinging, and the smoke slightly thinner in here. She relieves herself in the bedpan at the front of Madame Mannix's bed, pulls up her stockings and rebuttons her granduncle's coat. Is it afternoon? She wishes for the thousandth time that she could talk to her father. 
would it be better to go out into the city, especially if it is still daylight, and try to find someone? A soldier would help her. Anyone would. Though even as the thought rises, she doubts it. The unsteady feeling in her legs she knows stems from, hum from hunger. In the tumult of the kitchen, she cannot find a can opener, but she does find a paring knife in Madame Manning's knife drawer and the large coarse brick Madame used to prop open the fireplace grate. She will eat what is whatever is inside one of the two cans. Then she will wait a bit longer in case her uncle comes home, in case she hears anybody pass by the town crier or fireman and American serviceman with calendar in his mind. If she hears no one by the time she's hungry again, she will go out into what is left of the street. First, she climbs to the third floor, drink from the bathtub. With her lips against its surface, she takes long inward pulls, pooling, burbling in her gut, a trick she and Etienne have learned. We have learned over a hundred insufficient meals. Before you eat, drink as much water as you can, and you will feel full more quickly. At least, Papa, she says aloud, I was smart about the water. Then she sits on the third floor landing with her back against the telephone table. She braces one of the cans between her thighs, holds the point of the knife against its lid, and raises the brick to tap down on the knife handle. But before she can bring the brick down, the tripwire behind her jerks, and the bell rings, and someone enters the house. 5. January, 1941 January recess. The Commandant makes a speech about virtue and family and the emblematic fire that Schulpfort boys carry everywhere they go. A bull of pure flame to stoke the nation's hearths, fewer this and fewer that, his words crashing into Werner's cars into Werner's ears in a familiar battery, one of the most daring boys muttering afterward, Oh, I've got a hot pull of something in my core. In the bunk room, Frederick leans over the rim of his bed. His face presents a map of purples and yellows. Why don't you come to Berlin? Father will be working, but you can meet my For two weeks, Frederick has limped around, bruised and slow-footed and puffy, and not once has he spoken to Werner with anything more than his own gentle brand of distracted kindness. Not once has he accused Werner of betrayal, even though Werner did nothing while Frederick was beaten and has done nothing since, did not hunt down Rodel or point a rifle at Bastion, obeying indignantly on Dr. Hotman's door, demanding justice, as if Frederick understands already that both have been assigned to their specific courses, that there is no deviating now. Werner says, I don't have. Mother will pay your fare. Frederick tilts back up and stares at the ceiling. It's nothing. The train ride is a sleepy six-hour epic. Every hour, their rickety car shunted onto a siding, to let shrines full of soldiers headed for the front hurry past. Finally, Werner and Frederick disembark at a dim charcoal colored station and climb a long flight of stairs, each step painted with the same exclamation. Berlin smokes Junos and rises to the streets of the largest city Werner has ever seen. Berlin, the very name like two sh sharp bells of glory, capital of science, seat of the Fuhrer, nursery to Bohr, Einstein, Staudinger, Bayer. Somewhere in these streets, plastic was invented, x rays weren't discovered, continental drift was identified. What marvels does science cultivate here now? Superman, Superman soldiers, Dr. Hoffman says, and weather-making machines and missiles that can be steered by men a thousand miles away. The sky drops silver threads of sleet. Gray houses run in converging lines to the horizon, bunched as if to fend off gold. They pass shops stuffed with hanging meats and a trunk with a broken mandolin on his lap, and a trio of streetwalkers huddled beneath an awning who can't call the boys in their uniforms. Frederick leads them into a five-story townhouse on one block off a pretty avenue called the Nis Box Dress. He rings number two and a returning buzz echoes from inside their door and latches. They come into a dim foyer and stand beneath a pair of matched doors. Frederick presses a button and something high in the building rattles. And Werner whispers, you have an elevator? Frederick smiles. The machinery clangs downward and the lift clanks into place and Frederick pushes the wooden doors inward. Werner watches the interior of the building slide past in amazement. When they reach the second floor, he says, Can we ride it again? Frederick laughs. They go down, back up, down, up to the lobby a fourth time, and Werner is peering into the cables and weights above the car, trying to understand its mechanism when a tiny woman enters the building and shakes out her umbrella. With her other hand, she carries a paper sack, and her eyes rapidly apprehend the boys' uniforms and the intense whiteness of Werner's hair and the livid bruises beneath Ber Frederick's eyes. On the breast of her coat, a mustard yellow star has been carefully stitched, perfectly straight, one vertex down, another up. Drops fall like seeds from the tip of her umbrella. Good afternoon, Frau Schwarzenberger, says Frederick. He backs up against the wall of the elevator car and gestures for her to enter. She squeezes into the lift and Werner steps in behind her. From the top of her sack, shuts a sheaf of withered greens. Her collar, he can see, is separating from the rest of the coat. Threads are giving way. If she were to turn, their eyes would be a hand's width apart. Frederick presses two, then five. No one speaks. The old woman rubs the trembling tip of an index finger across one eyebrow. The lift clangs up one floor. Frederick snaps open the cage and Werner follows him out. 
He watches the old woman's shoes, gray shoes rise past his nose. Already the door to number two is opening. In a prone woman with baggy arms and a downy face rushes out and embraces Frederick. She kisses him on both cheeks and touches his bruises with her thumbs. It's all right, Franny. Horseplay. The apartment is sleek and shiny, full of deep carpets that swallow noise. Big rear windows look out into the hearts of four leafless lintons, sleet still falling outside. Mother isn't home yet, Franny says, smoothing down her apron with both palms. Her eyes stay on Frederick. You sure you're all right? Frederick says, of course, and together he and Werner pad into a warm, clean-smelling bedroom, and Frederick slides open a drawer, and when he turns around, he's wearing eyeglasses with black frames. He looks at Werner shyly. Oh, come on, you didn't already know. With his glasses on, Frederick's expressions seem to ease. His face makes more sense. This, Werner thinks, is who he is, a soft-skinned boy in glasses with taffy-colored hair and the finest trace of a mustache needle across his lip. Bird lover, rich kid. I barely hit anything in marksmanship. You really didn't know? Maybe, says Werner. Maybe I knew. How did you pass the eye exams? Memorize the charts. Don't they have different ones? I memorized all four. Father got them ahead of time. Mother helped me study. What about your binoculars? Their prescription. Cost a fortune. They sit in a big kitchen at a butcher's block with marble cap. The maid named Franny emerges with a dark loaf and a round of, block, and a round of cheese and she smiles at Frederick as she sets it down. They talk about Christmas and how Frederick was sorry to miss it and the maid passes out through a swinging door and returns with two white plates so delicate that they ring when she sets them down. Werner's mind reels. A lift? A Jewess? A maid? Berlin? They retreat into Frederick's bedroom which is populated with thin tin, sol with tin soldiers and model airplanes and wooden crates full of comic books. They lie on their stomachs and page through comics feeling the pleasure of being outside of school. Glancing at each other now and then as if, to, as if curious to learn whether their friendship will continue to exist in another place. Franny calls, I'm going, and as soon as the door closes, Frederick takes Warner by the arm into the living room and climbs a ladder built along the tall hardwood shelves and slides aside a large wicker basket from behind it. Brings down a huge book, two volumes enfolded in golden slip covers, each as big as a crib mattress. Here, his voice glows, his eyes glow. This is what I wanted to show you. Inside are lush, full-colored paintings of birds. Two white falcons swoop over each other, beaks open, a blood-red flamingo holds its black-tipped beak over stagnant water. Resplendent geese stand on a heartland and in a headland and peer into a heavy sky. Frederick turns the page with both hands. Pippery flycatcher, buff-breasted merganser, red-cocketed woodpecker, many of them larger in the book than in real life. Abaddon, Frederick says, was an American. Walked the swamps and woods for years, back when that whole country was just swamps and woods. He'd spend all day watching one individual bird, then he'd shoot it and prop it up with wires and sticks and paint it. Probably knew more than any bird or before or since. He'd eat most of the birds after he painted them. Can you imagine? Frederick's voice trembles with ardency, gazing up. Those bright mists and your gun on your shoulder and your eyes set firmly in your head. Werner tries to see what Frederick sees. A time before photography, before binoculars. And here was someone willing to tramp out into a wilderness, brimming with the unknown and bring back paintings. A book not so much full of birds as full of evidence of blue-winged trumpeting mysteries. He thinks of the Frenchman's radio program of Heinrich's Hertz's Principles of Mechanics. Doesn't he recognize the thrill in Frederick's voice? He says, my sister would love this. Father says we're not supposed to have it. Says we have to keep it hidden up there behind the basket because it's American was printed in Scotland. It's just birds. The front door opens and footsteps clack across the foyer. Frederick hurries the volumes back inside their slip covers. He calls Mother, and a woman wearing a green ski suit with white stripes down the legs enters, crying, Freddy, Freddy. She embraces her son and holds him back with straight arms while she runs a fingertip over a mostly healed cut along his forehead. Frederick looks off over her shoulder with a trace of panic on his face, as if afraid that she'll see what he, she was, he was looking at at the forbidden book or that she'll be angry about his bruises. She does not say anything, but merely stares at her son, tangled in thoughts Werner cannot guess, then remembers herself. And you must be Werner. The smile sweeps back onto her face. Frederick has written lots about you. Look at that hair. Oh, we adore guests. She climbs the ladder and restores the heavy Abaddon volumes to their shelf one at a time, as though putting away something irritating. The three of them sit at the vast oak table, and Werner thanks her for the train ticket, and she tells a story about a man she ran into just now. Unbelievable, really, who apparently is a famous tennis player, and every now and then she reaches across and squeezes Frederick's forearm. You would have been absolutely amazed, she says more than once, and Werner studies his friend's face to gauge whether or not he would have been amazed. And Franny returns to set out wine and more 
Rotschkeis and for an hour Werner forgets about Schubforte, about Bastion and the Black River Hose, about the Jewess upstairs, the things these people have, a violin on a stand in the corner and sleek furniture made from chromium steel and a brass telescope and a sterling silver chess set behind glass and this magnificent cheese that tastes like smoke has been stirred into butter. Wine glows sleepily in Werner's stomach and sleet ticks down through the lindens when Frederick's mother announces that they are going out. Tighten up your ties, won't you? She applies powder beneath Frederick's eyes and they walk to a bistro, the kind of restaurant Werner has never dreamed of entering. And a boy in a white jacket, barely older than they are, brings more wine. A constant stream of diners come to their table and to shake Werner's and Frederick's hands and ask Frederick's mother in low, s- sycophantic voices about her husband's latest advancement. Werner notices a girl in the corner, radiant, dancing by herself, throwing her face to the ceiling, eyes closed. The food is rich, and every now and then Frederick's mother laughs, and Frederick absently touches the makeup on his face where, while his mother says, Well, Freddy, has all the best there at this, that school. All the best, and seemingly every minute some new face comes along and kisses Frederick's mother on both cheeks and whispers in her ear. When Werner overhears Frederick's mother say to a woman, Oh, the Schwarzenberger crone will be gone by year's end, then we'll have the top floor. De worst schon sehen. He glances at Frederick whose smudged eyeglasses have gone opaque in the candlelight, whose makeup looks strange and lewd now as though it has intensified the bruises rather than concealed them. In a feeling of great uneasiness overtakes him. He hears Rodell swinging the hose, the smack of it across Frederick's upflung palms. He hears the voice of the boys in his Kammerdorfstein back in Zulverin sing, Live faithfully, fight bravely, and die laughing. The bistro is overcrowded. Everyone's mouths move too quickly. The woman talking to Frederick... His mother is wearing a nauseating quantity of perfume, and in the watery light seems subtly as if the scarf tra- trailing from the dancing girl's neck is a noose. Frederick says, Are you all right? Fine. It's delicious. But Werner feels something inside him screw tighter, tighter. On the way home, Frederick and his mother walk ahead. She loops her slender arm through his and talks to him in a low voice. Freddy this, Freddy that. The street is empty. The window's dead. The electric sign's switched off. Innumerable, innumerable shops, millions sleeping in beds around them, and yet, where are they all? As they reach Frederick's block, a woman in a dress leaning against a building bends over and vomits on the sidewalk. In the townhouse, Frederick pulls up on pajamas made of jelly green silk and folds his glasses on the nightstand and climbs barefoot into his brass childhood bed. Werner gets into a trundle bed that Frederick's mother has apologized for three separate times, although his mattress is more comfortable than any he has slept on in his whole life. The building falls quiet. Model automobiles glimmer on Frederick's shelves. Do you ever wish, whispers Werner, that you didn't have to go back? Father needs me to be a schulpforte, mother too. It doesn't matter what I want. Of course it matters. I want to be an engineer, and you want to study birds. Be like that American panther in the swamps. Why else do any of, why else do any of this if not be to become who we want to be? A stillness in the room, out there in the trees beyond Frederick's window, hangs an alien light. Your problem, Werner says. Frederick is that you still believe you own your life. When Werner wakes, it's well past dawn. His head aches and his eyeballs feel heavy. Frederick is already dressed, wearing trousers, an iron shirt, and a necktie, kneeling against the window with his nose against the glass. Bray Wagtail, he points. Werner looks past him into the naked lindens. Doesn't look like much, does he? murmurs Frederick. Hardly a couple of ounces of feathers and bones, but that bird can fly to Africa and back, powered by war- bugs and worms and desire. The wagtail hops from twig to twig. Werner rubs his aching eyes. It's just a bird. Ten thousand years ago, whispers Frederick, they came through here in the millions, when this place was a garden, one endless garden from end to end. Marie Laura wakes and thinks she hears the shuffle of Papa's shoes, the clink of his key ring. Oh, sorry. He's not coming back. Marie Laura wakes and thinks she hears the shuffle of Papa's shoes, the clink of his key ring, fourth floor, fifth floor, sixth. His fingers brush the doorknob, his body radiates a faint but palpable heat in the chair beside her. His little tools rasp across wood. He smells of glue and sandpaper and gualos blue is. But it is only the house groaning, the sea throwing foam against rocks, the seats of the mind. On the twentieth morning, without any word from her father, Marie Laura does not get out of bed. She no longer cares that her great uncle put on an ancient necktie and stood by the front door on two separate occasions and whispered weird rhymes to himself. A la pomme de terre, je suis par terre, au... Hericot je suis dans Leo, trying and failing to summon the courage to go out. She is no longer she no longer begs Madame Manic to take her to the train station, to write another letter, to spend another futile afternoon in the prefecture trying to petition occupation authorities to locate her father's. 
She becomes unreachable, sullen. She does not bathe, does not warm herself by the kitchen fire, ceases to ask if she can go outdoors. She hardly eats. The museum says they're searching child, whispers Madame Manic, but she tries to press her lips to Marie Lore's forehead. The girl jerks backward as if burned. As the museum replies to Etienne's appeals, they report that Marie Lore's father never arrived. Never arrived, says Etienne aloud. This becomes the question that drags his teeth through Marie Lore's mind. Why didn't he make it to Paris? If he couldn't, why didn't he return to St. Malo? I will never leave you, not in a million years. She wants only to go home, to stand in their four-room flat and hear the chestnut tree rustle outside her window. Hear the cheese cellar raise his awning, feel her father's fingers close around hers. If only she had begged him to stay. Not everything in the house scares her. The creaking stairs, shuttered windows, empty rooms, the clutter and silence. Etienne tries performing silly experiments to cheer her. A vinegar volcano, a tornado in a bottle. Can you hear it, Marie, spinning in there? She does not fan interest. Madame Manic brings her her omelettes, cassoulet, brochettes of fish, fabricating miracles out of ration tickets and the dregs of her cupboards. But Marie Lure refuses to eat. Like a snail, she overhears Etienne say outside her door, curled up so tight in there. But she is angry at Etienne for doing so little, at Madame Manic for doing so much, at her father for not being able to help her understand his absence, at her eyes for failing her, at everything and everyone. Who knew love could kill you? She spends hours kneeling... By herself on the sixth floor, with the window open and the sea hurling arctic air into the room, her fingers on the model of St. Malo slowly going numb, south to the gate of Denan, west to the Plague de Moule, back to the Rouverboro. Every second Etienne's house grows colder, every second it feels as if her father slips farther away. <laughs> Prisoner. One February morning, the cadets are roused from their beds at 2 a.m. and driven out into the glitter. In the center of the quadrangle, torches burn. Keg chested bastion waddles out with his bare legs showing beneath his coat. Frank Volkheimer emerges from the shoutness, dragging a tattered and skeletal man in mismatched shoes. Volkheimer sets him down beside the commandant where a stake has been driven, made and driven into the snow. Methodically, Volkheimer ties the man's torso to the stake. A vault of stars hangs overhead. The collective breath of the cadets ming mingles slowly, nightmarishly above the courtyard. Wilkheimer retreats. The commandant paces. You boys will not believe what a creature this is. What a foul beast. A centaur. Un untermensch. Everyone cranes to see. The prisoner's ankles are cuffed and his arms bound from wrist to forearms. His thin shirt is split at the seams and he gazes into some middle distance with hypothermic slackness. He looks Polish. Russian, maybe. Despite his fetters, he manages to sway lightly back and forth. Bastion says, this man escaped from a work camp, tried to violate a farmhouse and steal a liter of fresh milk. He was stopped before he could do something more nefarious. He gestures vaguely beyond the walls. This barbarian would tear out your throats in a second if we let him. Since the visit to Berlin, a great dread has been blooming inside Werner's chest. It came gradually as slow moving as the sun's passage across the sky, but now he finds himself writing letters to Judah in which she must be skirt the truth must contend that everything is fine when things do not feel fine. He descends into dreams in which Frederick's mom mutates into a leering, small-mouthed demon and lowers Dr. Hopman's triangles over his head. A thousand frozen stars preside over the quad. The cold is invasive, mindless. This look, Bastion says, and flourishes his fat hand, the way he's got nothing left. A German soldier never reaches this point. There's a name for this book. It's called Circling the Drain. The boys try not to siver. The prisoner blinks down at the scene as if from a very high perch. Wolkheimer returns carrying a clattering raft of buckets. Two other seniors uncoil a water hose across the quadrangle. Bastion explains. First the instructors, then upperclassmen. Everyone will pass and soak the prisoner with a bucket of water. Every man in the school. They start. One by one. Each instructor takes a full bucket from Wolkheimer and flings its contents at the prisoner a few feet away. Cheers rise into the frozen night. At the first two or three dowsings. The prisoner comes awake, rocking back on his heels. Vertical creases appear between his eyes. He looks like someone trying to remember something vital. Among the instructors in their dark capes, Dr. Hopman goes past, his gloved fingers pinching his collar around his throat. Hopman attempts his, accepts his bucket and throws a sheet of water, doesn't linger to watch it land. The water keeps coming. The prisoner's face empties. He slumps over the ropes, propping him up, and his torso slides down the stake. And every now and then, Volkheimer comes out of the shadows, looming fantastically huge, and the prisoner straightens again. The upperclassmen vanish inside the castle. The bottles, the buckets make a muted, frozen clanking as they are refilled. The 16-year-olds finish. The 15-year-olds finish. The cheers lose their gusto and appear longing to flee floods. Werner, run, run. 
Three boys until his turn. Two boys. Where he tries to flow images in front of his head, but the only one that comes are wretched. The hauling machine above pipe. Nine. The hunched miners walking as if they dragged the weight of enormous chains. The boy from the entrance examined, trembling before he fell. Everyone trapped in their roles. Orphans. Cadets. Frederick. Volkheimer. The old Jewess who lives upstairs. Even Yuta. When his turn arrives, Werner throws the water like all the others, and the splash hits the prisoner in the chest, and a perfunctory, perfunctory cheer rises. He joins the cadets, waiting to be released. Wet boots, wet cuffs, his hands have become so numb they do not see him his own. Five boards later, it is Frederick's turn. Frederick, who clearly cannot see well without his glasses, who has not been cheering when each bucket full of water finds its mark, who is frowning at the prisoner as though he recognizes something there. And Werner knows what Frederick is going to do. Frederick has to be nudged forward by the boy behind him. The upperclassman hands him a bucket and Frederick pours it out on the ground. Bastion steps forward, his face very scarlet and cold. Give him another. Again, Frederick sloshes it onto the feet, ice at his feet. He says in a small voice, he is already finished, sir. The upperclassman hands over a third pail. Throw it, commands Bastion. The night steams, the stars burn, the prisoner sways, the boys watch. The commandant tilts his head. Frederick pours the water onto the ground. I will not. Oh, what? Plague de Mou. Marie Laure's father has been missing without word for 29 days. She wakes to Madame Mannix's blocky pumps climbing to the, to the third floor, the fourth, the fifth. Etienne's voice on the landing outside his study. Don't. He won't know. She is my responsibility. Some unexpected steel emerges in Madame Mannix's voice. I cannot stand by one moment longer. She climbs the last flight. Marie Lord's door creaks open. The old woman crosses the floor and places her heavy boned hand on Marie Lord's forehead. You're awake. Marie Lord rolls herself into the corner and speaks through linens. Yes, madam. I'm taking you out. Bring your cane. Marie Lord dresses herself. Madame Manic meets her at the bottom of the stairs with a heel of bread. She ties a scarf over Marie Lord's head, buttons her coat all the way to the collar, and opens the front door. Morning in late February, and the air smells rainy and calm. Marie Lord hesitates, listening. Her heart beats two, four, six, eight. Hardly anyone is out yet, dear, whispers Madame Manic, and we are doing nothing wrong. The gate creaks. One step down, now straight on. That's it. The cobbled street passes up irregularly against Marie Lore's shoes. The tip of her cane catches, vibrates, catches again. A light rain falls on rooftops, trickles through tunnels, runnels, beads up on her scarf. Sound ricochets between the high houses. She feels and she, as she does in her first hour here, as if she has stepped into a maze. Far above them, someone shakes a duster out a window. A count mules. Meows? What terrors gnash their teeth out here? What was Papa so anxious to protect her, protect her from? They make one turn, then a second, and then Madame Manic steers over her left where Marie Lord does not expect her to. Where the city, to, where the city walls, fluttered with moss, have been scrolling long and broken, and they're stepping through a gateway. Madame? They pass out of the city. Stairs here. Mind yourself. One down, two. There you are. Easy as cake. The ocean. The ocean. Right in front of her. So close all this time, it sucks and booms and splashes and rumbles. It shifts and dilates and falls over itself. The labyrinth of St. Malo has opened onto a portal of something sound larger than anything she has ever experienced. Larger than the Jardin de Plantes, than the scene, larger than the grandest galleries at the museum. She did not imagine it properly. She did not comprehend the scale. When she raises her face to the sky, she can feel the thousand tiny spines of raindrops melt onto her cheeks. Her forehead. She hears Madame Manic's raspy breathing and the deep sounding of the sea among the rocks and the calls of someone down the beach echoing off the high walls. In her mind, she can hear her father polishing locks, Dr. Gefford walking along the rows of his drawers. Why didn't they tell her it would be like this? That's Monsieur Rodome calling to his dog, says Madame Manic. Nothing to worry about. Here's my arm. Sit down and take off your shoes. Roll up your coat sleeves. Marie Lord does, does this, as she is told. Are they watching? The botches? So what if they are? An old woman and a girl? I'll tell them we're digging clams. What can they do? Uncle says they've buried bombs in the beaches. Don't you worry about that. He's frightened of an ant. He says the moon pulls the ocean back. The moon? Sometimes the sun pulls too. He says that around the islands, the tides make funnels that can swallow boats whole. We aren't going anywhere near there, dear. We're just on the beach. Marie Laura unwinds her scarf and Madame Manic takes it. Briny, weedy, pewter-colored air slips down her collar. Madam? Yes? What do I do? Just walk. She walks. Now there are cold, round pebbles beneath her feet, now crackling weeds. Now something smoother, wet, unwrinkled, sand. She bends and spreads her fingers. It's like cold silks, cold, sumptuous silk onto which the sea has laid offerings. Pebbles, shells, barnacles, tiny slips of wrack. 
Her fingers dig and reach. The drops of rain touch the back of her neck, the backs of her hands. The sand pulls the heat from her fingertips, from the soles of her feet. A month's old knot inside Marie Lore begins to loosen. She moves along the tide line, almost crawling at first, and imagines the beach stretching off in either direction, ringing the prom- promontory, embracing the outer islands, the whole filigreed tracer of the Breton coastline with its wild capes and crumbling batteries and vine-choked ruins. She imagines the walled city beside, behind her, its soaring ramparts, its puzzled streets, all of it suddenly as small as Papa's model. But what surrounds the model is not something her father conveyed to her. What's beyond the model is the most compelling thing. A flock of gulls squalls overhead, each with a hundred thousand tiny grains of sand in her fist grind against its neighbor. She feels herself, her father pick her up and spin her around three times. No occupation soldier comes to arrest them. No one even speaks to them. In three hours, Marie Lore's numb fingers discover a stranded jellyfish, an encrusted buoy, and a thousand polished stones. She wades to her knees and soaks the hem of her dress. When Madame Manic finally leads her, damp and dazzled, back to the Rue Verborel, Marie Lore climbs all five flights and wraps in the door of Etienne's study and stands before him, wet satin stuck all over her face. You were gone a long time, he murmurs. I worried. Here, uncle. From her pockets, she brings up shells, barnacles, cowries, thirteen lumps of quartz gritty with sand. I brought you this, and this, and this, and this. Lapidary. In three months, Sergeant Major von Rumpel has traveled to Berlin and Stuttgart. He has assessed the value of a hundred confiscated rings, a dozen diamond bracelets, a Latvian cigarette case in which a lozenge of blue dope, topaz twinkled. Now, back in Paris, he has slept at the Grand Hotel for a week and sent forth his quarries like birds. Every night, the moment returns to him when he clasps that pearl-shaped diamond between his thumb and finger, forefinger, made huge by the lens of his loop, and believed he held the 133 carat sea of flames. He stands in the, he stared into the stone's ice blue interior where miniature mountain ranges seem to send back fire, crimsons and corals and violets, polygons of color twinkling and coruscating as he rotated it. And he himself almost convinced himself that the stories were true, that centuries ago Sultan's son wore a crown that blinded visitors, that the keeper of the diamond could never die, that the fabled stone had carried down through the pages of history and dropped into his palm. There was joy in that moment, triumph but an unexpected fear mixed with it. The stone looked something, like something enchanted, not meant for human eyes, an object that once looked at could never be forgotten. But eventually, reason won out. The joints of the diamond's facets were not quite as sharp as they should have been, the girdle just slightly waxy. More telling, the stone betrayed no delicate cracks, no pinpoints, not a single inclusion. A real diamond, his father used to say, is never entirely free of inclusions. A real diamond is never perfect. Had he expected it to be real, to be kept precisely where he wished it to be, to win such a victory in a single day? Of course not. One might think Von Rumpel would be frustrated, but he is not. On the contrary, he feels quite hopeful. The museum would not never have commissioned such a high-quality fake if they did not possess the real thing somewhere. Over the past weeks in Paris, in the hours between other tasks, he has narrowed a list of seven lapidaries to three, then to one. A half-Algerian named Dupont, who came of age cutting opal it appears dupont was making money before the war by fast fastening spindles into false diamonds for dowagers and baronesses also for museums one february night von rumpel lets himself into dupont's fastidious shop not far from sacre coeur he examines a copy of streeter's precious stones and gems drawings of cleavage panes trigonom- tri- trigonometric charts used for fastening when he finds several painstaking iterations of a mold that match exactly the size and pear cut shape of the stone in the vault of the museum he knows he has his man at von rumpel's request dupont has furnished with is furnished with forged food ration tickets now von rumpel waits he prepares his questions did you make other replicas how many do you know who has them now on the last day of february 1941 a dapper little Gestapo man comes to him with the news that the unwitting Dupont has tried to use the four tickets. He has been arrested. Kinderlitched. Ch- child's play. It's an attractive and drizzly winter's night. Scraps of melting snow shored up against the edges of the place de la Concorde. The city looking ghostly, its windows jeweled with raindrops. A close-cropped corporal checks von Rumpel's identification and points him not to a cell but to a higher ceiling third-story office where a typist sits behind a desk. On the wall behind her, a painted wisteria vine frays into a tangled modernist spray of color that makes von Rumpel uneasy. 
Dupont is cuffed to a cheap dining chair in the center of the room. His face is the color and polish of tropical wood. One rumble expected a melange of fear and indignation and hunger, but Dupont sits upright. One of the lenses in his eye glasses is already fractured, but otherwise he looks well enough. The typist twists her cigarette into an ashtray and a bright red smear of lipstick on its butt. The ashtray is full of fifty stubs squashed in there, limbless, somehow gory. You can go, says Von Rumpel, nodding at her, and levels his attention on the lapidary. He cannot speak German, sir. We will be fine, he says in French. Shut the door, please. Dupont looks up, some gland within him leeching courage into his blood. Von Rumpel does not have to force the smile. It comes easily enough. He hopes for names, but all he needs is a number. Dearest Marie Lore, we are in Germany now, and it is fine. I've managed to find an angel who will try to get this to you. The winter firs and alders are very beautiful here, and you are not going to believe this, but you will have to trust me. They serve us wonderful food. First class quail and duck and stewed rabbit. Chicken legs and potatoes fried with bacon and apricot tarts. Boiled beef with carrots. Cocoa vin on rice. Plum tarts, fruits, and creme glace. As much as we can eat, I look so look forward to the meals. Be polite to your uncle and madam, too. Thank them for reading this to you, and know that I am always with you, that I am right beside you. Your papa. Entropy. For a few for a week, the dead prisoner remains strapped to the stake in the courtyard, his flesh frozen gray. Boys stop and ask the corpse direction. Someone dresses him in a cartridge belt and helmet. After several days, a pair of crows take to standing on his shoulders, chiseling away with their beaks, and eventually the custodian comes out with the two third-year boys, and they hack the corpse's feet out of the ice with a maul and tip him into a cart and roll him away. Three times in nine days, Frederick is chosen as the weakest in field exercises. Bastion walks out farther than ever and counts more quickly than ever so that Frederick has to run four or five hundred yards. Often through deep snow, the boys race after him as if their lives depend on it. Each time he is caught, each time he is drubbed while Bastion looks on, each time Werner does nothing to stop it. Frederick lasts seven blows before falling, then six, then three. He never cries out, and never asks to leave, and this, in particular, seems to make the Commandant quake with homicidal frustration. Frederick's dream dreaminess, his otherness, is on him like a scent, and everyone can smell it. Werner tries to lose himself in his work in Hopman's lab. He has constructed a prototype of the transceiver and tests fuses and valves and handsets and plugs. But even in those late hours, it is as if the sky has dimmed and the school has become a darker, even more diabolical place. His stomach bothers him. He gets diarrhea. He wakes in John's distant quarters of the night and sees Frederick in his bedroom in Berlin, wearing his eyeglasses and necktie, freeing trapped birds from the pages of a massive book. You're a smart boy. You'll do well. One evening, when Hopman's down the hall in his office, Werner glances over at an imperious sleepy Volkheimer in his corner and says, That prisoner. Volkheimer blinks, st stone turning to flesh. They do that every year. He takes off his cap and runs one hand over the dense stubble of his hair. They say he's a Pole, a Red, a Cossack. He stole liquor, a kerosene, or money. Every year it's the same. Under the seams of the hour, boys struggle in a different, dozen different arenas, 400 children crawling along the edge of a razor. Always the same phrase, too, full comrades, circling the drain. But was it decent to leave him out there like that, even after he's dead? Decency does not matter to them. Then Hotman's crisp boot heels come clicking into the room and Volkheimer leans back into the corner and his eye sockets refill with shadow. And Werner does not have the chance to ask him which them he means. Boys leave dead mice in Frederick's boots. They call him a poof, blowjob, countless other juvenile sobriquets. Twice a fifth year takes Frederick's field glasses and smears the lenses with excrement. Werner tells himself that he tries. Every night he polishes Frederick's boots for him until they shine a foot deep. One less reason for a bunkmaster or bastion or an upperclassman to jump on him. Sunday mornings in the refectory they sit quietly in a sunbeam and Werner helps him with his schoolwork. Frederick whispers that in the spring he hopes to find a skylark nest in the grass as outside the school walls. Once he lifts his pencil and stares into space and says lesser spotted woodpecker and Werner hears a distant thrumming travel across the grounds and through the wall. In technical sciences, Dr. Hopman introduces the law of thermodynamics. Entropy. Who can say what that is? The boys hunch over their desks. No one raises a hand. Hopman stalks the rows. Werner tries not to twitch a single muscle. Fenning. Entropy is the degree of randomness or disorder in a system, doctor. His eyes fix on Werner's for a heartbeat, a glance both warm and chilling. Disorder. You hear the commandant say it. You hear your bunkmaster say it. There must be order. Life is chaos, gentlemen. And what we represent is an ordering to that chaos, even down to the genes. We are ordering the evolution of the species, winnowing out the inferior, the unruly, the chaff. This is the great project of the Reich, the greatest project human beings have ever embarked upon. 
Hotman writes on the blackboard that could have to describe the words of their composition books. The entropy of a closed system never decreases. Every process must, by law, decay. Although Etienne continues to offer objections, Madame Manic walks Marie Lore to the beach every morning. The girl knots her shoes herself, feels her way down the stairwell, and waits in the foyer with her cane in her fist while Madame Manic finishes up in the kitchen. I can find my own way, Marie Lore says the fifth time they step out. You don't have to lead. Twenty-two paces to the intersection with the Rue Distress. Forty more to the little gate. Nine steps down and she's on the sand. And twenty thousand sounds of the ocean engulf her. She collects pine cones dropped by trees who knows how far away. Thick hands of rope. Slick go globules of stranded polyps. Once a drowned sparrow. Her greatest pleasure is to walk to the north end of the beach at low tide. And squat below an island that Manic, Madame Manic calls Le Grand Bay. And let her fingers whisk around the tide pools. Only then, with her toes and fingers in the cold sea, does her mind seem to fully leave her father. Only then does she stop wondering how much of his leather letter was true. When he'll write again, why he must be in prison. She simply listens, hears, breathes. Her bedroom fills with pebbles, sea glass shells, forty scallops along the window sill, sixty-one whelks along the top of the armoire. She arranges them by species whenever she can, then by size, smallest on the left, largest on the right. She fills jars, pails, trays. The room assumes the smell of the sea. Most mornings after the beach, she makes the rounds with Madame Manic, going to the vegetable market, occasionally to the butchers, and then delivering food to whichever neighbors Madame Manic de decides are most in need. They climb an echoing stairwell, rap on a door, an old woman invites them in, asks for news, insists on all three of them, drink a thimble full of sherry. Madame Manic's energy, Marie Lure's learning, is extraordinary. She burgeons, shoots off stalks, wakes up early, works late, concocts beasts without a drop of cream, Loaves with less than a cup of flour, then clomp to, they clomp together the narrow streets, Marie Lore's hand on the back of Madame's apron, following the odors of her stews and cakes. In such moments, Madame seems like a great moving wall of rose bushes, thorny and fragrant, and cackling, crackling with bees. Still warm bread to an ancient widow named Madame Blanchard, soup to Monsieur Saget. Slowly, Marie Lore's brain becomes a three-dimensional map in which exists glowing landmarks, a thick plane tree in the place... Ox, herbs, nine potted topiaries outside the Hotel Continental, six stairs up a passageway called the Rue de Connetable. Several days a week, Madame brings food to crazy Harold Bazin, a veteran of the Great War who sleeps in an alcove behind the library in sun or snow, who lost his nose, left ear, and eye to shellfire, who wears an enabled copper mask over his face. Harold Bazin loves to talk about the walls and warlocks and pirates of St. Malo. Over the centuries, he tells Marie Lure the city ramparts have kept out bloody bloodthirsty marauders, Romans, Celts, Norsemen, some say sea monsters. For 1,300 years, he says, the walls kept up bloodthirsty English sailors who would park their ships offshore and launch flaming projectiles at the houses, who would try to burn everything and starve everybody, who would stop at nothing to kill them all. The mothers of St. Malo, he says, used to tell their children, sit up straight, mind your manners, or an Englishman will come out in the night to cut your throat. Harold, please, says Madame Manic, you'll frighten her. In March, Etienne turns 60, and Madame Manic stews little clams, polordis, with shallots, and serves them alongside mushrooms and quarters of two hard-boiled eggs. The only two eggs, she reports, she could find in the city. Etienne talks in his soft voice about the eruption of Krakatau, how, in all of his earliest memories, ash from the East Indies turned the sunsets over St. Malo's blood red. Big veins of crimson glowing above the sea every evening into Marie Lure, her pockets lined with sand, her face glowing from wind. The occupation seems for a moment a thousand miles away. She misses Papa, Paris, Dr. Gefford, the gardens, her books, her pine cones, all are holes in her life. But over these past few weeks, her existence has become tolerable, at least out on the beaches. Her privation and fear are rinsed away by wind and color and light. Most afternoons, after making the morning rounds with Madame, Marie Laura sits on her bed with the window open and travels her hands over her father's model of the city. Her fingers past the shipbuilder's sheds on the Rue des Arts, past Madame Rule's bakery on the Rue Robert Sukhoff. In her imagination, she hears the bakers sliding about on a flower-slick floor, moving in the way she imagines ice skaters must move, baking loaves in the same 400-year-old oven that Monsieur Rule's great-great-grandfather used. Her fingers pass the, c the cathedral steps. Here an old man clips roses in a garden. Here, beside the library, crazy Harold Bison murders, murmurs to himself as he peers with his one eye into an empty wine bottle. Here's the convent. Here's the restaurant Ches Chush beside the fish market. Here's number four, Rue Vaubrel, its door slightly recessed. We're downstairs, Madame Manic kneels over beside her bed, 
shoes off, rosary beads slipping through her fingers, a prayer for practically every soul in the city. Here, in a fifth floor room, Etienne walks beside his empty shelves, trailing his fingers over the places where his radios once stood. And somewhere, beyond the borders of the model, beyond the borders of France, in a place her fingers cannot reach, her father sits in a cell, a dozen of his whittled models on a windowsill, a guard coming toward him with what she wants very badly to believe is a feast. Quail and duck stewed rabbit, chicken legs and potatoes fried with bacon and apricot tarts. A dozen trays, a dozen platters, as much as he can eat. Nadel M. Hehafen. Midnight. Dr. Hoffman's hounds bound through frozen fields beside the school, drops of quicksilver skittering through the white. Behind them comes Hoffman in his fur cap, walking with short strides as though counting paces over some great distance. In the rear comes Werner, carrying the pair of transceivers he and Hoffman have been testing for months. Hoffman turns, his face bright. Nice spot here. Good sight line. Set it down, Fenning. I've sent our friend Volkheimer ahead. And he's somewhere on the hill. Werner sees no track, only a humped swale of glitter in the moonlight and the white forest beyond. He has the KX transmitter and ammunition box, Hoffman says. He is to conceal himself and broadcast steadily until we find him where his battery dies. Even I do not know where he is. He smacks his gloved hands together and the dogs swirl around him, their breath smoking. Ten square kilometers. Locate the transmitter. Locate our friends. Where looks at the ten thousand small mantle trees. Out there, sir. Out there. Hoffman draws a flask from his pocket and screws it without looking at it. This is the fun part, Fenning. Hotman stamps a clearing in the snow and Werner sets up the first transceiver, uses measuring tape to pace off 200 meters and sets up the second. He uncoils the grounding wires, raises the aerials, and switches them on. Already his fingers are numb. Try 80 meters, Fenning. Typically, teams won't know what band to search, but for tonight, our first field test will cheat a bit. Werner puts on the headset and fills his ears with static. He dials up the RF gain, adjusts the filter. Before long, he's tuned in both receivers to Volkheim's transmitter pinging along. I have him, sir. Hotman starts smiling in earnest, the dogs caper and sneeze with excitement. From his coat, he produces a grease pencil. Just do it on the radio. Teams won't always have paper, not in the field. Werner sketches out the equation on the metal casing of the transceiver. He starts plugging in numbers. Hotman hands him a slide rule. In two minutes, Werner has a vector and a distance. Two and a half kilometers. And the map? Hotman's little aristocratic face gleams with pleasure. Werner uses a protractor and compass to draw the line. Lead on, Fenning. Werner folds the map into his coat pocket. Packs up the transceivers and carries one in each hand like matching suitcases. Tiny snow crystals sift down through the moonlight. Soon the school and its outbuilding look like toys in the white plain below. The moon slips lower, half lidded eye, and the dogs stick close to their master. Mouth steaming and Werner sweats. They drop into a ravine and climb out one kilometer, two. Sublimity, Hotman says, panting. You know what that is, Fenning? He is tipsy, animated, almost prattling. Never has Werner seen him like this. It's the instant when one thing is about to become something else. Day to night, caterpillar to butterfly, fawn to doe, experiment to result, boy to man. Far up a third climb, Werner unfolds the map and double checks his bearings with a compass. Everywhere the silent trees gleam, no tracks save their own, the school lost behind them. Shall I set out the retrievers again, sir? Hotman puts his fingers to his lips. Werner triangulates again and sees how close they are to his original reading. Under half a kilometer, he repacks the transceivers and picks up his pace, hunting now on the scent. All three dogs sensing it too, and Werner thinks, I have found a way in. I am solving it. The numbers are becoming real, and the trees unload. Siftings of snow, and the dogs freeze and twitch their nose, locked on a scent. Pointing as if out a pheasant, Huntman holds up a palm, and finally, Werner, coming up through a gap between the trees, laboring as he carries the big cases, sees the form of a land, man lying face up in the snow, transmitter his feet, and Hannah raising into the low branches, the giant. The dogs tremble in their stances. Hotman keeps his palm up. With his other hand, he unholsters his pistol. This close fenning, you cannot hesitate. Volkheimer's left side faces them. Warner can see the vapor of his breath rise and dissipate. Hotman names his wather right at Volkheimer for a long and startling moment. Warner is certain that his teacher is about to shoot the boy, that they are in grave danger, every single cadet, and he cannot hear help but hear Yuda as she stood beside the canal. Is it right to do something only because everyone else is doing it? Something in Werner's soul shuts its scaly eyes, and the little professor raises his pistol and fires it into a, the sky. Volkheimer leaps immediately into a squad, his head coming around as the hounds release toward him, and Werner's heart feels as if it had been blown to pieces in his chest. Volkheimer's arms come up as the dogs charge him, but they know him. They are leaping on him in play, barking and scampering, and Werner watches the huge boy throw off the dogs as if they were house cats. Dr. Hutman laughs. His pistol smokes, and he takes a long drink from his flask and passes it to Werner. And Werner puts it to his lips. He is a police pr professor, after all. The transceivers work. He's out in the luminous, starlit night, feeling the stinging glow of brandy flow into his gut. 
This, says Hotman, is what we're doing with the triangles. The dogs circle and duck and romp. Hotman relieves himself beneath the trees. Volkheimer trudges toward Werner, lugging the big KX transmitter. He grows even larger. He rests a huge mittened hand on Werner's cap. It's only numbers, he says, quietly enough that Hotman cannot hear. Pure math, cadet, as Werner, mimicking Hotman's clipped accent, he pressed his glove fingertips together all five to five. You have to accustom yourself to thinking that way. It is the first time Werner has heard Volkheimer laugh, and his countenance changes. He becomes less menacing and more like a beloved, humongous child, more like the person he becomes when he listens to music. All the next day, the pleasure of his success lingers in Werner's blood. The memory of how it seemed almost holy to walk to him to walk beside Big Volkheimer back to the castle, down through the frozen trees, past the rooms of sleeping boys ranked like gold bars and strong rooms. Werner felt an almost fatherly protective for the others as he addressed beside his bunk. As lumbering Volkheimer continued on toward the dormitories of the upperclassmen, an ogre among angels, a keeper crossing a field of grainstones, a knight. Proposal. Marie Lore sits in her customary spot in the corner of the kitchen, closest to the fireplace, and listens to the friends of Madame Manic complain. The price of mackerel, says Madame Fontenot. You'd think they had to sail to Japan for it. I cannot remember, says Madame Pebran, the postmistress, what a proper plum tastes like. And these ridiculous shoe ration coupons, says Madame Rule, the baker's wife. Theo has number 3,401, and they haven't even called 400. It's not just the brothels on the route the Venard anymore. They're giving all the summer apartments to the freelancers. Big Claude and his wife are getting extra fat. Damn bosses have their lights on all day. I cannot bear one more night stuck inside indoors with my husband. Nine of them sit around the table. Knees pressed to knees, ration card restrictions, abysmal puddings, the deteriorating quality of fingernail varnish. These are crimes they feel in their souls. To hear so many of them in a room together confuses and excites Marie Lore. They are giddy when they should be serious, somber after jokes. Madame Hubran cries over the non-availability of demerara sugar. Another woman's complaint about tobacco disintegrates from his sentences to hysterics about the phenomenal size of the perfumer's backside. They smell of stale bread, of stuffy living rooms, crammed with dark, titanic Breton furnishings. Madame Rule says, So, the Gautier girl wants to get married. The family has to melt all its jewelry to get the gold for the wedding room. The gold gets taxed 30% by occupation authorities. Then the jeweler's work is taxed of 30%. By the time they paid them, there's no ring left. The exchange rate is farce. The price of care is indefensible. Duplicity lives everywhere. Eventually, Madame Manic dead bolts the kitchen door and clears her throat. The woman fall quiet. We're the ones who make the world run, Madame Manic says. You, Madame Gabor, your sons repair their shoes. Madame Brand, you and your daughter sort their mail. And you, Madame Rule, your bakery makes much of their bread. The air stretches tight. Marie Laura has the sense that they are watching someone slide onto thin ice or hold a palm over a flame. What are you saying? That we do something. Put bombs in their shoes? Poop in their bread? Brittle laughter. Nothing so bold as all that. But we could do smaller things. Simpler things. Like what? First, I need to know if you're willing. A charge of silence on shoes. Marie Laura can feel them all poised there. Nine minds swinging slowly around. She thinks of her father. In prison for what? In aches. Two women leave, claiming obligations involving grandchildren. Others tug at their blouses and rattle their chairs so the temperature of the kitchen has gone up. Six remain. Marie Lure sits among them, wondering who will cave, who will tattle, who will be the bravest, who will lie on her back and let her last breath curl up to the ceiling as a curse upon the invaders. You have other friends. Look out, P Pusswood. Martin Burkhard yells as Frederick crosses, crosses the quad. I'm coming for you tonight. He convulses his pelvis maniacally. Someone defecates on Frederick's bunk. Werner hears Volkheimer's voice. Decency does not matter to them. Bed shitter, spits a boy. Bring me my boots. Frederick pretends not to hear. Night after night, Werner retreats into Hotman's laboratory. Three times now, they have gone out into the snow to track down Volkheimer's transmitter. Each time, they have found him more directly. During the most recent field test, Werner managed to set up the transceivers, find their transmission, and plot Volkheimer's location on the map in under five minutes. Hotman promises trips to Berlin. He unrolls schematics from an electronics factory in Austria and says, Several ministries have demonstrated enthusiasm for a project. Werner is succeeding. He's being loyal. He's being what everyone agrees is good. And yet, every time he wakes and buttons his tunic, he feels he's betraying something. One night, he and Volkheimer trudge back through the slush, Volkheimer carrying the transmitter, both receivers, and the folded antenna under one arm. Werner walks behind him, content to be in his own, to be in the shadow. The trees drip, the branches seem moments away from erupting into bloom. Spring. In two more months, Volkheimer will be given his commission and go to war. 
They stop a moment so Volkheimer can rest and Werner bends to examine one of their transceivers. Draws a little screwdriver from his pocket and tightens a loose hinge plate. Volkheimer looks down at him with great tenderness. What you could be, he says. That night, Werner climbs into bed and stares up at the inner side of Frederick's mattress. A warm wind blows against the castle and somewhere a shutter bangs and snow melt trickles down the long downspouts. As quietly as he can manage, he whispers, Are you awake? Frederick leans over the side of his bunk and for a moment in the nearly complete darkness, Werner believes they will finally say to each other what they have not been able to say. You could go home, you know, to Berlin. Leave this place. Frederick only blinks. Your mother wouldn't mind. She'd probably like to have you around. Franny, too. Just for a month, even a week. As soon as you leave, the cadets will let up. And by the time you return, they'll have moved on to someone else. Your father wouldn't even have to know. But Frederick tips back onto his bed, and Werner can no longer see him. His voice comes reflecting down from the ceiling. Maybe it'd be better if we, weren't, if we aren't friends anymore, Werner. Too loud. Dangerously loud. I know it's a liability walking with me, eating with me, always folding my clothes and shining my boots and tutoring me. You have your studies to think of. Werner clenches his eyes, the memory of his attic bedroom swamps him, clicking of mouse feet in the walls, sleep tapping the window, the ceiling so sloped he could stand only in the spots closest to the door, and the feeling that somewhere just behind his vision, ranged like spectators in a gallery, his mother and his father and the Frenchman from the radio were all watching him through the rattling window to see what he could do. He sees Yuda's crestfallen face bent over the pieces of their broken radio. He has the sensation that something huge and empty is about to devour them all. That's not what I meant, Werner says into his blanket. But Frederick says nothing more, and both boys lie motionless a long time, watching the blue spokes of moonlight rotate through the room. Old Ladies Resistance Club Madame Rule, the baker's wife, a pretty voice woman who smells mostly of yeast, but also sometimes of face powder, with a sweet perfume of sliced apples, straps a stepladder to the roof of her husband's car, and drives the route de Curtin at dusk with Madame Goubon, and rearranges road signs with a ratchet set. They return drunk and laughing to the kitchen of number four, Rue Varbaro. Dinner is now twenty kilometers to the north, says Madame Rule, right in the middle of the sea. Three days later, Madame Fontenot overhears that the German garrison commander is allergic to goldenrod. Madame Carr, the florist, tucks great fistfuls of it into an arrangement headed for the chateau. The woman funnels a shipment of rayon to the wrong destination. They intentionally misprint a train timetable. Madame Pabrad, the postmistress, slides an important-looking letter from Berlin into her underpants, takes it home, and starts her evening fire with it. They come spilling into Etienne's kitchen when Gleeful reports that someone has heard the garrison commander sneezing, or that the dog shit placed on a brothel doorstep, reached the target of a German shoe's bottom perfectly. Madame Manic pours sherry or cider or muscadet. Someone sits stationed by the door to serve as a sentry. Small and stoop, Madame Fontenot boasts that she tied up the switchboard of the chateau for an hour. Dowdy and strapping Madame Goubon says she placed her grandson's paint a stray dog, the colors of the French flag, and sent it running through the place. Chateau Briand. The woman cackled, thrilled. What can I do? asked the ancient widow, Madame Blanchard. I want to do something. Madame Manic asks everyone to give Madame Blanchard their money. You'll get it back, she says. Don't worry. Now, Madame Blanchard, you've had beautiful handwriting all your life. Take this fountain pen of Master Etienne's. On every five franc note, I want you to write free fans now. No one can afford to destroy money, right? Once everyone has spent their bills, our little message will go out all over Brittany. The woman clap. Madame Blanchard squeezes Madame Manic's hand and wheezes and blinks her glossy eyes in pleasure. Sometimes Etienne comes down grumbling, one shoe on, and the whole kitchen goes quiet while Madame Manic fixes his tea and sets it on a tray. Etienne carries it back upstairs. Then the woman starts up again, scheming, gabbling. Madame Manic brushes Marie Laure's hair in long, absent minded strokes. Seventy six years old, she whispers, and I can still feel like this? Like a little girl with stars in my eyes. Diagnosis. The military doctor takes Sergeant Major von Rumpel's temperature, inflates a blood pressure cuff, examines his heart with a penlight, his throat with a penlight. This very morning, von Rumpel inspected a 15th century Davenport and supervised its installment onto a rail garment for Marshal Goring's hunting lodge. The private who brought it to him described plundering the villa they took it from. He called it shopping. The Davenport makes von Rumpel think of an 18th century Dutch tobacco hot box made out of brass and copper and encrusted with tiny diamonds that he examined earlier this week. And the, toba and the tobacco box and his thoughts as inexorably as gravity back to the sea of flames. In his weaker moments, he imagines walking in some future hour between arcades of pillar and the great Fuhr Fuhrer Museum at Linz. His heels clacking smartly in the marble twilight, cascading through high windows. He sees a thousand crystalline display cases so clear they seem to float above the floor. Inside them wait the world's mineral treasures, harvested from every hole in the globe. Dipites and topaz and amethyst and California ruby light. 
what was the phrase? Like stars flung off the brows of archangels. In the very center of the gallery, a spotlight falls through the ceiling into a pedestal. There, inside a glass cube, glows a small blue stone. The doctor asks Von Rumpel to lower his trousers. Though the business of war is not let up for even a day, Von Rumpel has been happy for months. His responsibilities are doubling. There are not, it turns out, a lot of Aryan diamond experts in the Reich. Just three weeks ago, outside a tiny Sun Street station west of Bratislava, he examined an envelope full of perfectly clear, well-faceted stones. Behind him rumbled a truck full of paintings wrapped in paper and packed in straw. The guards whispered that a Rembrandt was in there, and pieces of a famous altarpiece from Cacao, all being sent to a salt mine somewhere deep beneath the Austrian village of Altesse, where a mile-long tumble drops into a glittering arcade filled with shelving, three stories high, upon which the high command is stacking Europe's finest art. They will assemble everything under one unassailable roof, a temple to the human endeavor. Visitors will marvel at it for a thousand years. The doctor probes his groin. No pain? None. Nor here? None. It would have been too much to hope for names from the Lepidarian Paris. DuPont, after all, would not have known who had given the replicas of the diamond. He had no insight into the latest, last-second safeguards of the museum, but DuPont was of service nonetheless. Von Rumpel needed a number, and he got it. Three. The doctor says... You may dress and washes his hands at a sink. In the two months leading up to the invasion of France, DuPont fashioned the three replicas for the museum. Did he use the real diamond to make them? He used a casting. He never saw the real diamond. Von Rumpel believed him. Three replicas, plus the real stone, somewhere on this planet among its sextillion grains of sand. Four stones, one of them in the basement of the museum, locked in a safe. Three more to find. There are moments when Von Rumpel feels impatience rising in him like bile, but he forces himself to swallow it back. It will come. He buckles his belt. The doctor says, We need to take a biopsy. You will want to telephone your wife. <laughs> Weakest, number three. The scales of cruelty tip. Maybe Bastion exacts some final vendetta. Maybe Frederick goes looking for his only way out. All Winter knows for certain is that one April morning he wakes to find three inches of slush on the ground and Frederick not in his bunk. He does not show up breakfast or poetics or morning field exercises. Each story Winter hears contains its own flaws and contradictions as though the truth is a machine whose gears are not meshing. First he hears that a group of boys took Frederick out and set up torches in the snow and told him to shoot the torches with his rifle to prove he had adequate eyesight. Then Werner hears that they brought him charts for eye exams and when he could not read them, they forced fed the charts to him. But what does the truth matter in this place? Werner imagines twenty boys closing over Frederick's body like rats. He sees the fat, gleaming face of the commandant, the throat spilling out of his collar, reclined like a king on some high-backed oak throne, while blood slowly fills the floor, rises past his ankles, past his knees. Werner skips lunch and walks in a daze to the school's infirmary. He's received attention, or worse, and it's a bright, sunny, bright noon, but his heart is being crushed slowly in a vise, and everything is slow and hypnotic, and he watches his arm push his, his arm work as it pulls open the door as if he's peering through several feet of blue water. A single blood bed with blood in it, blood on the pillow and on the sheets, and even on the enameled metal on the, the door of bed frame. Pink rags in a basin, half unrolled bandage on the floor, the nurse bustles over and grimaces at Werner. Outside of the kitchens, she's the only woman at the school. Why so much blood, he asks. She says four fingers across her lips, debating perhaps whether to tell him or pretend she does not know. Accusation or resignation or complicity. Where is he? Leipzig. For surgery. She touches a round white button on her uniform with my, what might be an inconveniently trembling finger. Otherwise, her manner is entirely stern. What happened? Shouldn't you be at noon mealtime? Each time he blinks, he sees the men of his childhood, laid off miners drifting through black alleys. Men with hooks for fingers and vacuums for eyes. He sees Bastion standing over a smoking river, snow falling all around him. Fear, folk, fatherland, steal your body, steal your soul. When will he be back? Oh, she says, a soft enough word. She shakes her head. A blue soap box at the table above it, a portrait of some foregone officer in a crumbling frame. Some previous boy had sent through this place to die. Cadet? Warner has to sit on the bed. The nurse's face seems to occupy multiple distances, a mask atop a mask atop a mask. What is you two doing at this exact moment? Wiping the nose of some wailing newborn or collecting newspapers or listening to presentations from army nurses or darning another sock. Praying for him, believing in him, he thinks, I will never be able to tell her about this. <laughs> Dearest Marie Lore, the others in my cell are mostly kind. Some tell jokes. Here's one. Have you heard about the Wehrmacht exercise program? Yes, each morning you raise your hands above your head and leave them there. Ha ha, my angel has promised to deliver this letter for me at great risk. It is very safe and nice to be out of the ghost house for a minute. We are building a road now, the work is good, my body is getting stronger. Today I saw an oak tree disguised as a chestnut tree. I think it is called a chestnut oak. I would like very much to ask some of the botanists in the gardens about when, it, when I get home. 
I hope you and Madame and Tan will keep sending things. They say we will be allowed to receive one parcel each, so something has to get through eventually. I doubt they would let me keep any tools, but it would be wonderful if they would. You absolutely would not believe how pretty it is here, Ma Cherie, and how far we are from danger. I am incredibly safe, as safe as safe can be, your papa. Grotto. It's summer and Marie Laura is sitting in the alcove behind the library with Madame Manic and Crazy Harold Bazin. Through his covered mask, through a mouthful of soup, Harold says, I want to show you something. He leads Marie Laura and Madame Manic down what Marie Laura thinks is the Rue de Boyer, though it could be the Rue Vincent de Gournay or the Rue de Hot Sales. They reach the base of the ramparts and turn right, following a lane Marie Laura has not been on before. They descend two steps past the through a curtain of hanging ivy, and Madame Manic says, Harold, Please, what is this? The alley grows narrower and narrower until they must walk single file. The walls close on either side and then they stop. Marie Laura can feel stone blocks mounting vertically on both sides to rest their shoulders. They seem to rise forever. If her father has built this alley into his model, her fingers have not discovered it yet. Harold rummages in his filthy trousers, bringing hard behind his mask. Where the wall of the rampart should be on the left, Marie Laura hears a lock give way. A gate creaks open. Watch your head, he says, and helps her through. They clamber down into a cramped, moist space that positively reeks of the sea. We're beneath the wall, twenty meters of granite on top of us. Madame Manic says, Really, Harold, it's gloomy as a graveyard in here, but Marie Laura ventures a bit farther, the soles of her shoes slipping, the floor angling down, and then her shoes touch water. Feel this, says Harold Basin, and crouches and brings her hand to a curved wall which is completely studded with snails, hundreds of them, thousands. So many, she whispers. I don't know why, maybe because they're safe from goals. Here, feel this, I'll turn it over. Hundreds of tiny, squirming, hydraulic feet beneath a horny ridge top, a sea star. Blue muscles here, and here's a dead stone crab. Can you feel his claw? Watch your head now. The surf breaks nearby, water pearls past her shoes. Marie Laura wades forward, the floor of the room is sandy, the water barely ankle deep. From what you can tell, it's a low grotto, maybe four yards long and half as wide, shaped like a loaf of bread. At the far end is a thick grate through which lustrous, clear sea winds washes. Her fingertips discover barnacles, weeds, a thousand more snails. What is this place? Remember I told you about the dogs of the watch? A long time ago, city kennel keepers would keep the mastiffs in here. Dogs as big as horses. At night, a curfew bell would ring and the dogs would be let loose onto the beaches to eat any sailor who dared come ashore. Somewhere beneath those muscles is a stone with the date 1165 scratched into it. But the water, even at the highest height, doesn't get more than waist deep. Back then, the times might have been lower. We used to play in here as boys, I mean your grandfather, sometimes your great-uncle, too. The tide flows past their feet. Everywhere, muscles click and sigh. She thinks of the wild old seamen who lived in this town, smugglers and pirates, sailing over the dark seas, winding their ships between 10,000 reefs. Harold, we should go now, calls Madame Manic, her voice echoing. This is no place for a young girl. Marie Laura calls. It's fine, Madame. Hermit crabs, anemones sending out a tiny jet of seawater once she pokes them, galaxies of snails, a story of life imminent in each. Finally, Madame Manic coaxes them out of the kennel, and Carazia Harold leads Marie Laura back through the gate and locks it behind them. Before they reach the place, Bruce or Madame Manic walks out front. He taps Marie Laura's shoulder. His whisper comes in her left ear. His breath smells like crushed insects. Could you find that place again, do you think? I think so. He puts something iron in her hand. Do you know what it is? Marie Laura closes her fist. It's a key. <laughs> Intoxicated. Every day there is word of another victory, another advance. Russia collapses like an accordion. In October, the student body gathers around a big wireless to listen to the first Fuhrer declare Operation Typhoon. German companies plant flags miles from Moscow. Russia will be theirs. Werner is 15. A new boy sleeps in Frederick's bed. Sometimes at night, Werner sees Frederick when he is out there. His face appears over the edge of the upper bunk, where his silhouette presses binoculars to the window pane. Frederick, who did not die, but did not recover. Broken jaw, cracked school, brain trauma. No one was punished. No one questioned. A blue automobile came to the school, and Frederick's mother got out and walked into the commandant's residence and emerged soon afterward. He tilted against the weight of Frederick's duffel bag, looking very small. She climbed back into the car, and he drove away. Volkheimer is gone. There are stories that he has become a fearsome sergeant in the war mocks, that he led a platoon into the last town on the road to Moscow, hacked off the fingers of dead Russians and smoked them in a pipe. The newest crop of cadets grow wild in their urgency to prove themselves. They sprint, shout, hurl themselves over obstacles, and field exercises. They play a game where ten boys get red armbands and ten get black. The game ends when one team is all twenty. 
It seems to Warner as if all the boys around him are intoxicated, as if at every meal the cadets fill their tank cuts with not the cold mineralized, mineralized water of Schulpforta, but with a spirit that leaves them glazed and dazzled, as if they ward off a vast and inevitable tidal wave of anguish only by staying forever drunk on rigor and exercise and gleaming boot leather. The eyes of the most bullheaded boys radiate a shining determination. Every ounce of their attention has been trained to fail a weakness. They study Werner with suspicion when he returns from Hotman's lab. They do not trust that he's an orphan, that he's often alone, that his accent carries a whisper of the French he learned as a child. We are a volley of bullets, sing the newest cadets. We are cannonballs, we are the tip of the sword. Werner thinks of home all the time. He misses the sound of rain on the zinc roof above his dormer, the feral energy of the orphans, the scratchy singing of Frau Elena as she rocks a baby in the parlor, the smell of the coking plant coming in under the dawn. The first reliable smell of every day. Mostly he misses Yuta. Her loyalty, her obstinacy, the way she always seems to recognize what is right. Though in Werner's weaker moments he resents those same qualities in his sister. Perhaps she is the impurity in him, the static in the signal that the bullies can sense. Perhaps she's the only thing keeping him from surrendering totally. If you have a sister back home, you're supposed to think of her as a pretty girl on a propaganda poster. Rosy cheeked, brave, steadfast. She's whom you fight for, whom you die for. But Yuta? Yuta sends letters at the school, sends her blacks out. Almost completely. She asks questions that should not be asked. Only Werner's affiliation with Dr. Hoffman, his privileged status as the favorite of technical sciences professor, keeps him safe. A company in Berlin is producing their transceiver, and already some of their units are coming back from what Hoffman calls the field. Blown apart or burned or drowned in mud or defective, and Werner's job is to rebuild them while Hoffman talks into his telephone and writes requisitions for replacement parts or spends whole fortnights away from the school. Weeks pass without a letter from Utah. Werner writes four lines, a smattering of platitudes. I am fine. I am so busy. He hands to the monk master. Dread swamps him. You have minds, Bastion murmurs one evening in the refectory, each boy hunching almost imperceptibly farther over his food as the commandant's finger grazes the back of his uniform. But when, but minds are not to be trusted. Minds are always drifting toward ambiguity, toward questions. When what you really need is certainty, purpose, clarity, do not trust your minds. Werner sits in the lab late at night, alone again, and trolls the frequencies on the Gruden dig tube radio that Volkheimer used to borrow from Hopman's office, searching for music, for echoes, for what he is not sure. He sees circuits break apart and reform. He sees Frederick staring into his book of birds. He sees the furor of the mines at Zolverai, the shunting cars, the banging mock, the trundling conveyors, smokestacks, stil silting the sky day and night. He sees Utah slashing back and forth with the lit torches, darkness and encroaches from all sides. Wind pressed against the walls of the lab. Wind. The Commandant loves to remind them that that comes all the way from Russia, a Cossack wind, the wind of candle-eating barbarians with hogs' heads who will stop at nothing to drink the blood of German girls. Gorillas who must be wiped off the earth. Static, static. Are you there? Finally, he shuts off the radio. Into the stillness come the voices of his masters, echoing from one side of his head while memory speaks from the other. Open your eyes and see what you can with them before they close forever. The Blade and the Welk the Hotel Duo's dining room is big and somber and full of people talking about U-boats off Gibraltar and the inequities of currency exchange and four-stroke marine diesel engines. Madame Manic orders two bowls of chowder that she and Marie Lure promptly finish. She says she does not know what to do next. Should they keep waiting? So she orders two more. At last, a man in rustling clothing sits down with them. You are sure your name is Madame Walter? Madame Manic says, You are sure your name is Renee? A pause. And her? My accomplice. She can tell if someone is lying just by hearing him speak. He laughs. They talk about the weather. Sea air exudes from the man's clothes as if he has been blown here by a gale. While he talks, he makes ungainly movements and bumps the table so that the spoons clatter in their bowls. Finally, he says, We admire your efforts, madam. The man who calls himself Rene starts talking extremely softly. Marie Laura catches only phrases. Look for special insignia on their license plates. WH for Army. WO for Air Force. WM for Navy. And you can note, find someone who could every vessel that comes in and out of the harbor this information is very much in demand madame manic is quiet if more is said that marie lord cannot overhear if there is a pantomime going on between them notes past stratagems agreed upon she cannot say some level of accord is reached and soon enough she and madame manic are back in the kitchen at number four rural Ru Ru Ru. madame manic clatters around in the cellar and hauls up canning supplies this very morning she announces she has managed to procure what might be the last two crates of peaches in france she hums as she helps marie lord with the peeler Madam? Yes, Marie. What is a pseudonym? It is a fake name, an alternative name. If I were to have one, what sort of name could I choose? Well, says Madame Mamic, she pits and quarters another peach. You can be anything. You can be the mermaid if you like, or Daisy, Violet. How about the Welk? I think I would like to be the Welk. The Welk, that is an excellent pseudonym. 
And you, Madam Manic, what would you like to be? Me? Madam Manic's knife pauses. Crickets singing in the cellar. I think I would like to be the blade. The blade? Yes. The perfume of the peaches makes a bright, ruddy color. The blade? Repeats Marine Lure. Then they both start laughing. Dear Werner, why don't you write? The foundries run day and night and the stacks never stop smoking and it's been cold here, so everyone burns some free thing to stay warm. Sawdust, hard coal, soft coal, lime, garbage, war widows, and every day there are more. I'm working at the laundry with the twins, Hannah and Suzanne and Claudia Forster, you remember her. We're mending tunics, all trousers mostly. I'm getting better with a needle, so at least I'm not pricking myself all the time. Right now, I just finished my homework. Do you have homework? There are fabric shortages, and people bring in slip covers, curtains, old coats. Anything that can be used, they say, will must be used. Just like all of us here. Ha! I found this under your old coat. Seems like you could use it. Love, Utah. Inside the homemade envelope waits Warner's childhood notebook. His handwriting across the cover. Questions. Across his pages swarm boyhood drawings, inventions, an electric bed heater he wanted to build for Frau Elena. Bicycle with trains to drive both wheels. Can magnets affect liquid? Why do boats float? Why do we feel dizzy when we spin? A dozen empty pages at the back. Juvenile enough, presumably to make it past the sensor. Around him sounds the din of boots, clatter rifles, stocks on the ground, barrels against the wall. Grab cups off hooks, plates off racks, cue for boiled beef. Over him breaks a wave of homesickness so cute that he has to clamp his eyes. Alive before you die. Madame Manic goes into Etienne's study on the fifth floor. Marie Laura listens on the stairs. You could help, Madame says. Someone, likely Madame, opens a window and the bright air of the sea washes onto the landing, stirring everything. Etienne's curtains, his papers, his dust. Marie Laura is longing for her father. Etienne says, Please, Madame, close the window. They are rounding up blackout offenders. The window stays open. Marie Laura creeps down another stair. How do you know whom they round up, Etienne? A woman in Renee was given nine months in prison for naming one of her hogs Go Bells. Did you know that? A palm reader in Kenkel was shot for predicting De Gaulle would return in the spring. Shot? Those are only rumors, madam. Madame Hebrard Herb says that a dinner man, a grandfather, Etienne, was given two years in prison for wearing the Cross of Lorraine under his collar. I heard they're going to turn the whole city into a big ammunition dump. Her great uncle laughed softly. It all sounds like something a sixth former would make up. Every rumor carries a seed of truth, Etienne. All of Etienne's adult life, Marie Laura realizes, Madame Manic has tended his fears. Skirted them, mitigated them. She creeps down one more stair. Madame Manic is saying, You know things, Etienne, about maps, tides, radios. It's already too dangerous, all those women in my house. People have eyes, madame. Who? The perfumer, for one. Claude. She snores. Little Claude is too busy smelling himself. Claude is not so little anymore. Even I can see his family gets more than the others. More meat, more electricity, more butter. I know how such prizes are won. Then help us. I don't want to make trouble, madame. Isn't doing nothing a kind of troublemaking? Doing nothing is doing nothing. Doing nothing is as good as cloud raining. The wind gusts, and Marie Laura's mind shifts and gleams, draws needles and thorns in the air, silver then green and silver again. I know ways, says Madame Manic. You what ways? Whom have you put your trust in? You have to trust someone sometime. If your same blood doesn't run in the arms and legs of the person you're next to, you can't trust anything. And even then, it's not a person you wish to fight, Madame. It's a system. How do you fight a system? You try. What would you have me do? Dig out that old thing in the attic. You used to know more about radios than anyone in town. Anyone in Brittany, perhaps. They've taken all the receivers. Not all. People have hidden things everywhere. You'd only have to read numbers, is how I understand it. Numbers on strips of paper. Someone, I don't know who, maybe Harold Bazin, will bring them to Madame Rule, and she'll collect them. And bake the messages right into the bread. Right into it, she laughs. To Marie Laura, who laughs once twenty years younger. Harold Bazin. You, tr you are trusting Harold Bazin. You are cooking secret codes into bread. What fat kraut was going to eat those awful loaves? They took all the good flour from themselves. We bring home the bread. You transmit the numbers. Then we burn the pieces of paper. This is ridiculous. You act like children. It's better than not acting at all. Think of your nephew. Think of Marie Lore. Curtains flap and papers rustle. And the two adults have a standoff in the study. Marie Lore has crept so close to her great uncle's doorway that she cannot touch the door frame. Madame Manic says, don't you want to be alive before you die? Marie is almost 14 years old, madam. Not so young. Not during war. 14 years old die the same as anybody else, but I want 14 to be young. I want Mori Lure scoots back up a step. Have they seen her? She thinks of the stone candle crazy Harold Bazin led her to. The snails gathered in their multitudes. She thinks of the many times her father put her on his bicycle. She'd balance on the seat and he would stand on the pedals and they'd glide on the roar of some Parisian boulevard. She'd hold his hips and bend her knees and they'd fly between cars, down hills, through gauntlets of odor and noise and color. Etienne says, I'm going back to my book, madam. Shouldn't you be preparing for dinner? <coughs> no help. In January 1942, Werner goes to Dr. Hopman in his glowing firelit office.
twice as warm as the rest of the castle and asked to be sent home. The little doctor is sitting behind his big desk with an anemic-looking roasted bird on a dish in front of him. Quail or dove or grouse, rolls of schematics on his right. His hounds splay on the rug before the fire. Werner stands with his cap in his hands. Hopman shuts his eyes and runs a finger kiss type across one eyebrow. Werner says, I will work to pay the trade fare, sir. The blue fretwork of veins in Hopman's forehead pulsates. He opens his eyes. You? The dogs look up as one. A three-headed hydra. You who gets everything. Who comes here and listens to concerts and nibbles chocolates and warms yourself by the fire. A shred of roasted bird dances on Hopman's cheek. Perhaps for the first time, Werner sees in his teacher's thinning blonde hair and his black nostrils and his small, almost elven ears. Something pitiless and inhuman. Something determined only to survive. Perhaps you believe you are somebody now. Somebody of importance. Werner clenches his cap behind his back to keep his shoulders from quaking. No, sir. Hotman folds his napkin. You are an orphan, Fenning, with no allies. I can make you whatever I want to make you. A troublemaker, a criminal, an adult. I can send you to the front and make you, and make sure you are crouched in a trench in the ice until the Russians cut off your hands and feed them to you. Yes, sir. You will be given your orders when the school is ready to give you your orders. No sooner. We serve the Reich, Fenning. It does not serve us. Yes, sir. You will come to my lab tonight, as usual. Yes, sir. No more chocolates. No more special treatment. In the hall, with the door shut behind him, Werner presses his forehead against the wall, and the vision of his father's last moments come to him. The crushing, crushing press of the tunnels, the ceiling lowering, jaw pinned against the floor, skull splintered. I cannot go home, he thinks, and I cannot stay. The disappearance of Harold Bazin. Marie Lore follows the odor of Madame Manic's soup through the pl- place à uh, Herbes and holds the warm pot outside the alcove behind the library while Madame raps on the door. Madame says, Where is Monsieur Brazin? Must have moved on, says the librarian. The doubt in his voice is only partially disguised. Where could Harold Bazin move to? I'm not sure, Madame Manic. Please, it is cold. The door closes. Madame Manic swears. Marie Lore thinks of Harold Bazin's story. Lugubrious monsters made of sea foam, mermaids with fishy private parts, the romance of English sieges. He'll be back, says Madame Manic, as much to herself as to Marie Lore, but the next morning Harold Bazin is not back, or the next. Only half the group attends the following meeting. Do you think he was helping us? whispers Madame Brand. Was he helping us? I thought he was carrying messages. What sort of messages? It is getting too dangerous. Madame Manic paces Marie Lore can almost feel the heat of her frustration from across the room. Leave then, her voice smoldered. All of you. Don't be rash, says Madame Rule. We'll take a break. A week or two. Wait for things to settle. Harold Bazin with his copper mask and boyish avidity and his breath like crushed insects. Where, Marie Lua wonders, do they take people? The guest house her father wants taken to? Where they written, write, where they write letters about wonderful food and mythical trees? The baker's wife claims they are sent to camps in the mountains. The grocer's wife says they are sent to nylon factories in Russia. It seems as likely to Marie Lua that the people would just disappear. The soldiers throw a bag over whomever they want to remove, run electricity through it, and then that person is gone. Vanished. Expelled to some other world. The city thinks Marie Lore is slowly being remade into the model upstairs. Streets sucked empty one by one. Each time she steps outside, she becomes aware of all the windows above her. The quiet is fretful, unnatural. It's what a mouse must feel. She thinks as it steps from its hole into the ground, open blades of a meadow, never knowing what shadow must come cruising above. Everything poisoned. New silk banners hang above the refectory halls of blaze with slogans. They say, Disgrace is not to fall, but to lie. They say, Be slim and slender, as fast as a greyhound, as tough as leather, as hard as croup steel. Every few weeks, another instructor vanishes, sucked up into the engines of the war. New instructors, elderly townsmen of unreliable sobriety and disposition, are brought in. All of them, when her notices, are in some way broken. They limp, or are blind in one eye, or their faces are lopsided from strokes of the previous war. The cadets show less respect to the new instructors who in turn have shorter tempers and soon the school feels to warn like a grenade with its pin pulled. Strange things start happening with the electricity. It goes off for 15 minutes, then surges. Clocks run fast, light bulbs brighten, flare, and pop, and set a soft rain of glass falling onto the cold corridors. Days of darkness ensue. The switch is dead, the grate empty, the bunk rooms and showers become icy, for lighting the caretaker resorts to torches and candles. All the gasoline is going to the war, and few cars come trundling through the school gates. Food is delivered by the same weathered mule, its ribs showing as it drags its cart. More than once, Werner slices the sausage on his plate to find pink worms squirming inside. The uniforms of the new cadets are stiffer and cheaper than his own. No longer do they have access to live ammunition for marksmanship. Werner would not be surprised if Bastion started handing out rocks and sticks. And yet, all the news is good. We are at the gates of the Caucasus, proclaims Hopman's radio. We have taken oil fields. We will take Svalbard. We move with astounding speed, 5,700 Russians killed, 45 Germans lost. Every six or seven days, the same two pallid casualty assistance officers enter the refectory, and 400 faces go ashen from the efforts 
of not turning to watch. The boys move only their eyes, only their thoughts, tracking their minds the passage of the two officers that move between tables, seeking out the next boy whose father has been killed. The cadet they stop behind often tries to pretend that he doesn't notice the presence. He puts his forks in his mouth and chews, and usually it is then that the taller officer, a sergeant, sets a hand on the boy's shoulder. The boy looks up at them with a full mouth and an unsteady face and follows the officers out, and the big oak double doors creak shut, and the lunchroom slowly exhales and edges back to life. Reinhard Woolman's father falls, Carl Westerholster's father falls, Martin Burkhardt's father falls, and Martin tells everyone on the very same night his shoulder is tapped that he is happy. Doesn't everything he says die last and too soon? Who would not be honored to fall, to be a paving stone on the road to final victory? Werner looks for uneasiness in Martin's eyes, but cannot find it. For Werner, doubts turn up regularly. Racial purity, political purity, Bastion speaks to a horror of any sort of corruption, and yet... Werner wonders in the dead of night, isn't life a kind of corruption? A child is born and the world sets in upon it, taking things from it, stuffing things into it. Each bite of food, each particle of light entering the eye, the body can never be pure. But this is what the commandant insists upon, why the Reich measures their noses, clocks their hair color. The entropy of a closed system never decreases. At night, Werner stares up at Frederick's bunk, the thin slats of the miserable stained mattress, another new boy sleeps up there. Dieter Ferdinand, a small, muscular kid from Frankfurt who does everything he is told with a terrifying ferocity. Someone coughs. Someone else moans. A train sounds its lonesome whistle somewhere out beyond the lakes. To the east, always the train moves to the east. Beyond the rims of the hills, they go to the huge, trodden borderlands of the front. Even as he sleeps, the trains are moving, the catapults of history rattling past. Werner laces his boots and sings the songs and marches the marches and acting less out of duty than out of a time-worn desire to be dutiful. Bastion walks the rows of boys at their dinners. What's worse than death, boys? Some cadet, poor cadet, is called to attention. Cowardice. Cowardice, agrees Bastion. The boy sits with while the commandant slogs forward, nodding to himself, pleased. Lately, the commandant speaks more and more intimately of the Fuhrer and the latest thing, prayers, petroleum, loyalty that he requires. The Fuhrer requires trustworthiness, electricity, boot leather. Werner is beginning to see, approaching his 16th birthday, that what the Fuhrer really requires is boys. Great rows of them walk into the conveyor belt to climb on. Give up cream for the Fuhrer, sleep for the Fuhrer, aluminum for the Fuhrer. Give up Reinhard Woolman's father and Carl Westerholz's father and Martin Burkhardt's father. In March 1942, Dr. Hopman calls Warner to his office. Half-packed crates litter the floor. The hounds are nowhere to be seen. The little man paces and is not until Warner announces himself that Hopman stops. He looks as if he is slowly being engulfed by something beyond his control. I have been called to Berlin. They want me to continue my work there. Hopman lifts an hourglass from a shelf and sets it on a crate and his pale silver tipped fingers hang in the air it will be as you dream sir the best equipment the best minds that is all says dr hopman werner steps into the hall out on the snow dusty quad thirty first formers jog in place their breath showing in short-lived plumes chubby slick chin abominable bastion yells something he raises one short arm and ball boys turn on their heels raise their rifles above their head and run faster in place their knees flashing in the moonlight Visitors. The electric bell rings at bell rings at number four Rue Vaubrel. Etienne LeBlanc, Madame Manic, and Marie Lure stop chewing at the same time, each thinking they have found me out. The transmitter in the attic, the woman in the kitchen, the hundred chips at the beach. Etienne says, You were expecting someone? Madame Manic says, No one. The woman come to the kitchen door. The bell rings. All three go to the foyer. Madame Manic opens the door. French policemen, two of them, they are there. They explain at the request of the Natural History Museum in Paris. The jarring of their boot heels on the boards of the foyer seems loud enough to shatter the windows. The first one is eating something, an apple and brie lord decides. The second smells of shaving balm and roasted meat, as if they have been feasting. All five, Etienne, Marie lord Madame Manic, and the two men sit in the kitchen around the square table. The men refuse a bowl of stew. The first clears his throat. Right or wrong, he says. He has been convicted of theft and conspiracy. All political, all prisoners, political or otherwise, says so the second, are forced to labor, even if they have not been sentenced to it. The museum has written to wardens and prison directors all over Germany. We do not yet know what, exactly which prison. We believe it could be Bretonneau. We're certain they did not hold a proper tribunal. Etienne's voice comes spiraling up from beside Marie Lore. Is that a good prison? I mean, one of the better ones? I'm afraid there are no good German prisons. A truck passes in the streets. The sea folds onto the plague de mule fifty yards away, she thinks. They just say words, and what are words but sounds these men shape out of breath. Weightless vapors they send into the air of the kitchen dissipate and die. She says, You have come all this way to tell us things we already know. Madame Minnick takes her hand. 
ETM murmurs, we did not know about this place called Bertinal. The first policeman said, you told the museum he has managed to smuggle out two letters. The second, may we see them? Off goes Etienne, content to believe that someone is on the job. Marie Laure ought to be happy too, but something makes her suspicious. She remembers something her father said back in Paris, on the first night of the invasion as the waiter for train. Everyone is looking out for himself. The first policeman snaps flesh off his apple with his teeth, either looking at her. To be so close to them makes her feel faint. Etienne returns with both letters, and she can hear the men passing the pages back and forth. Did he speak of anything before he left, of any particular activities or errands we should be aware of? Their French is good, very Parisian, but who knows where their loyalties lie. If your same blood doesn't run in the arms and legs of the person you're next to, you can't trust anyone. Everything feels compressed and submarine to Marie Lord just then, as if the five of them have been submerged in a murky aquarium, full, over full of fish, and their fins keep bumping as they shift about. She says, My father is not a thief. Madame Menick's hand squeezes hers. Etienne says, He seemed concerned for his job, for his daughter, for France, of course. Who wouldn't be? Mademoiselle, says the first man. He is talking directly to Marie Laure. Was there no specific thing he mentioned? Nothing. He had keys, many keys at the museum. He turned in his keys before he left. May we look at whatever he brought here with him? The second man's ad. His bags, perhaps? He took his rucksack with him, says Marie Laure, when the director asked him to return. May we look anyway? Marie Laure could feel the gravity in the room increase. What do they hope to find? She imagines the radio equipment high above her. Microphone, transceiver, all those dials and switches and cables. Etienne says, you may. They go into every room. Third floor, fourth, fifth. On the sixth, they stand in her grandfather's old bedroom and open the huge wardrobe with its heavy doors and cross the hall and strand over the, stand over the model of St. Malo and Marie Laure's room and whisper to each other and tromp back downstairs. They ask a total of one question. About three free French flags rolled up in a second floor closet. Why does Etienne have them? You put yourself in jeopardy keeping those, says the second policeman. You would not want the authorities to think you are terrorists, says the first. People have been arrested for less. Whether this is offered as favor or threats remain unclear. Marie Laure thinks, do they mean Papa? The police finish their search to say goodnight with perfect politeness and leave. Madame Manic lights a cigarette. Marie Laure's stew is cold. Etienne fumbles with the fireplace grate. He shoves the flag one after another into the fire. No more. No more. He says the second louder than the first. Not here. Madame Manic's voice. They found nothing. There's nothing to find. The acrid smell of burning cotton fills the room. Her great uncle says, You do what you like with your life, madam. You have always been there for me, and I will try to be there for you. But you may no longer do these things in this house, and you may not do them with my great niece. <laughs> to my dear sister Yuda, it is very difficult now. Even paper is hard to. We had no heat in the... Frederick used to say there is no such thing as free will, and that every person's path is predetermined for him, just like... And that my mistake was that I... I hope someday you can understand. Love to you and Frau Lana too. See how... The frog cooks. In the weeks to come, Madame Manic is perfectly cordial. She walks with Marie Laure to the beach most mornings, takes her to the market, but she seems an absent, asking how Marie Laure and Etienne are doing with perfect courtesy, saying good morning as if they are strangers. Often she disappears for half a day. Marie Laure's afternoon becomes longer, lonelier. One evening she sits at the kitchen table while her great uncle reads aloud. The vitality which the snail eggs possess surpasses belief. We have seen certain species frozen in solid blocks of ice, and yet regain their activity when subjected to the influences of the warmth. Etienne pauses. We should make supper. doesn't appear that Madame will be back tonight. Neither of them moves. He reads another page. They have been kept for years in pillboxes, yet when subjecting them to moisture have crawled upon appearance as well as ever. The shell may be broken, even portions of it removed, and yet after a certain lapse of time, the injured parts will be repaired by deposition of shelly matter at the fractured parts. There's hope for me yet, says Etienne and laughs, and Marie Laure is reminded that her great uncle was not always so fearful, that he had a life before this war and before the last one too, that he was once a young man who dwelled in the world and loved it as she does. Eventually, Madame Manette comes through the kitchen door and locks it behind her, and Etienne says good evening rather coldly, and after a moment, Madame Manick says it back. Somewhere in the city, Germans are loading weapons or drinking brandy, and history has become some nightmare from which Marie Laure desperately wishes she could wake. Madame Manick takes a pot from the hanging wrap and fills it with water. Her knife falls through what sounds like potatoes, the blade striking the wood, cutting the wood beneath. Please, madame, says Etienne, allow me. You are exhausted. He does not get up, and Madame Manic keeps chopping potatoes, and when she is done, Marie Laure hears her push a load of them into the water with the back of her knife. The tension in the room makes Marie Laure feel dizzy, as if she can blow sense the planet rotating. Sink any U-boats today, murmurs Etienne. Blow up any German tanks. Madame Menix snaps open the door of the icebox. Marie Laure can hear her rummage through a drawer. A match flares. A cigarette lights. Soon enough, a bowl of undercooked potatoes appear before Marie Laure. She feels around the table pot. For a fork, but finds none. Do you know what happens, Etienne? Says Madame Menix from the other side of the kitchen. When you drop a frog in a pot of boiling water, you will tell us, I am sure. 
it jumps out. But you know what happens when you put the frog in a pot of cool water and then slowly bring it to a boil. You know what happens then. Marie Laura waits. The potatoes steam. Madame Manic says, the frog cooks. Orders. Werner is summoned by an 11-year-old in full regalia to the commandant's office. He waits on a wooden bench in a slowly building panic. They must suspect something. Maybe they've discovered some fact about his parentage that even he doesn't know. Something ruinous. He remembers when Lance Corporal came through the door of Childson's house to escort him to Air Seedlers. The certainty that the instruments of the right could see through their walls, through skin, into the very soul of each subject. After several hours, the commandant's assistant calls him in and sets down his ballpoint and looks across his desk as though Werner is one among a vast series of trivial problems he must put right. It has come to our attention, cadet, that your age has been recorded incorrectly. Sir, you are 18 years old, not 16, as you have claimed. Werner puzzles. The absurdity is plain. He remains smaller than most of the 14-year-olds. Our formal technical sciences prof professor, Dr. Hotman, has called our attention to the discrepancy. He has been arranged that you will be sent to a special technology division of the work march. A division, sir. You have been here under false pretenses. His voice is oily and pleased. His chin is non-existent. Out a window, the school band practices a triumphal march. Werner watches a Nordic-looking boy stagger beneath the weight of a tuba. The commandant urged disciplinary action, but Hotman suggests that you would be eager to offer your skills to the Reich. From behind his desk, the assistant produces a folded uniform, slate gray, eagle on the breast, litson on the collar, then a green-black coal scuttle helmet, obviously too large. The band blares, then stops. The band instructor screams names. The commandant assistant says, You are very lucky, cadet, to serve as an honor. When, sir? You'll receive instructions within a fortnight. That is all. Pneumonia. Breton spring in a great onslaught of damp invades the coast. Fog on the sea, fog in the streets, fog in the mind. Madame Manic gets sick when Marie Laura holds her hand over Madame's chest. Heat seems to steam up out of her sternum as though she cooks from the inside. Her breathing devolves into trains of oceanic coughing. I watch the sardines, murder Madame, and the termites and the crows. Etienne summons a doctor who prescribes rest, aspirin, and aromatic violet comfits. Marie Laura sits with Madame for the worst of it. Strange hours when the old woman's hands go very cold and she talks about being in charge of the world. She is in charge of everything, but no one knows. It is a tremendous burden, she says, to be responsible for every little thing, every infant born, every leaf falling from under a tree. Every wave that breaks onto the beach, every ant on its journey. Deep in Madame's voice, Marie Laura hears water, atolls, and archipelagos, and lagoons, and fjords. Etienne proves to be a tender nurse, washcloths, broth, now and then a page from Pasteur or Rousseau, his manner forgiving her all transgressions past and present. He wraps Madame in quilts, but eventually she shivers so deeply, so profoundly, that he takes the big heavy rag rug off the floor and lays it on top of her. <laughs> Dearest Marie Laura, your parcels arrived, two of them, dated months apart. Joy is not a strong enough word. They let me keep the toothbrush and comb, though not the paper they were wrapped in, nor the soap. How I wish they would let us have soap. They said our next word posting would be to a chocolate factory, but it was cardboard. All day we manufactured cardboard. What did they do with so much? All my life, Marie Laura, I've been the one carrying the keys. Now I hear them jangling in the empty mornings when they come for us, and every time I won't reach in my pocket only to find it empty. When I dream, I dream I am in the museum. Remember your birthdays? How there were always two things on the table when you woke? I'm sorry you turned out like this. If you ever wish to understand, look inside Etienne's house. Inside the house. I know you do the right thing, though I wish the gift were better. My angel is leaving, so if I give this to you, I will. I do not worry about you because I know you are very smart in keeping yourself safe. I am safe too, so you should not worry. Thank Etienne for reading this to you. Thank you in your heart, the brave soul who carries this letter away from me and on its way to you, your papa. <laughs> Treatments. Von Rumpel's doctor says that fascinating research is being done on mustard gases, that the anti-tumor properties of any number of chemicals are being explored. The prognosis is looking up in test subjects. Lymphoid tumors have been seen to reduce in size, but the injections make Von Rumpel dizzy and weak. In the days following, he can hardly manage to comb his hair or convince his fingers to button his coat. His mind plays tricks, too. He walks into a room and forgets why he's there. He stares at his superior and forgets what the man just said. The sounds of passing cars like the tines of forks dragged along his nerves. Tonight, he wraps himself in hotel blankets and orders soup and unwraps a bundle from Vienna. The mousy brown librarian has sent copies of the Tavernier and the Streeter, and even, most remarkably, stenciled duplicates of De Boot's 1604 Gemurum at Lepidum Historia, written entirely in Latin. Everything she could find concerning the Sea of Flames, nine paragraphs total. It takes all his concentration to bring the texts into focus. A goddess of the earth who fell in love with a god of the sea, a prince who recovered from catastrophic injuries, who ruled from within a blur of light. Von Rumpel closes his eyes and sees a flame-haired goddess charge through the tunnels of the earth, drop of flame glowing on her wake. 
He hears a priest with no tongue say, The keeper of this stone will live forever. He hears his father say, See obstacles as opportunities, Reinhold. See obstacles as inspiration. Heaven. For a few weeks, Madame Manic gets better. She promises Etienne she will remember her age, not try to be everything to everyone, not fight the war by herself. One day in early June, almost exactly two years after the invasion of France, she and Marie Lure walk through a field of Queen Anne's lace east of West St. Malo. Madame Manic told Etienne that they were going to see if strawberries were available at the St. Servan market, but Marie Lure is certain that when they stopped to greet a woman on the way there, Marie dropped off one envelope and picked up another. At Madame's suggestion, they lay down in the weeds, and Marie Laura listens to honeybees and mind the flowers and tries to imagine their journeys as Etienne described them, each worker following a rivulet of odor, looking for ultraviolet patterns in the flowers, filling baskets on her hind legs with pollen grains, then navigating drunk and heavy all the way home. How do they know what parts to play, those little bees? Madame Manic takes off her shoes and lights a cigarette and lets out a contented groan. Insects drone, wasps, hoverflies, a passing dragonfly. Etienne has taught Marie Laura to distinguish each by its sound. What's a Ronio machine, madam? Something to help make pamphlets. What does it have to do with that woman we met? Nothing to trouble yourself over, dear. Horses nicker, and the wind comes off the sea gentle and cool and full of smells. Madam, what do I look like? You have many thousands of freckles. Papa used to say they were like stars in heaven, like apples in a tree. They are little brown dots, child. Thousands of little brown dots. That sounds ugly. On you, they are beautiful. Do you think, madam, that in heaven we will really get to see God face to face? We might. What if you're blind? I expect that if God wants us to see something, we'll see it. Uncle Etienne says heaven is like a blanket babies cling to. He says people have flown airplanes ten kilometers over the earth and found no kingdoms there, no gates, no angels. Madame Manic cracks off a ragged chain of coughs that sends tremors of fear through Marie Lore. You are thinking of your father, she finally says. You have to believe your father will return. Don't you ever get tired of bleeding, believing, madam? Don't you ever want proof? Madame Manic rests her head a hand on Marie Laura's forehead, the thick hand that first reminded her of gardeners or geologists. You must never stop believing. That's the most important thing. The Queen Anne's lace sways on its top roots, and the bees do their steady work. If only life were like a Jules Verne novel, thinks Marie Laura, and you could page ahead when you most needed to and learn what would happen. Madam? Yes, Marie. What do you think they eat in heaven? I'm not so sure they need to eat in heaven. Not eat. You would not like that, would you? But Madame Manek does not laugh the way Marie Laura expects her to. She doesn't say anything at all. Her breath clatters in and out. Did I offend you, madam? No, child. Are we in danger? No more than any other day. The grass is tossed and shimmy. The horses is naked. Madame Manek says, almost whispering. Now that I think about it, child, I expect heaven is a lot like this. Frederick. Werner spends the last of his money on train fare. The afternoon is bright enough, but Berlin seems not to want to accept the sunlight as though its buildings have become gloomier and dirtier and more splotchy in the months since he last visited. Though perhaps what has changed are the eyes that set it. Rather than ring the bell right away, Warner laps the block three times. The apartment windows are uniformly dark. Whether unlit or blacked out, he cannot tell. At a certain point on each circuit, he passes a storefront filled with undressed mannequins. And though he knows each time that it is merely a trick of the light, he cannot stop his eyes from seeing them as corpses strung up by wires. Finally, he rings the bell for, for number two. No one buzzes down and he notices from the nameplates that they are no longer in number two. Their name is on number five. He rings. A returning buzz as she's from inside. The lift is out of order, so he walks up. The door opens. Franny. With a downy face and swinging flaps of skin under her arm, she gives him a look that one trapped person gives another. Then Frederick's mother swishes out of sight of them wearing tennis clothes. Why, Werner? She loses herself momentarily in troubled reverie. Surrounded by sleek furniture, some of it wrapped in thick wool blankets. Does she blame him? Does she think that he is partially responsible? Perhaps he is. But then she comes awake and kisses him on both cheeks, and her bottom lip quivers lightly as if his materialization is preventing her from keeping certain shadows at bay. He won't know you. Don't try to make him remember. It will only upset him. But you are here. I suppose that's something. I was about to go. Very sorry, I cannot say. Show him in, Franny. The maid leads him into a grand drawing room. Its ceilings are swirl with plaster flourishes. Its walls painted a delicate eggshell blue. No paintings have been hung yet, and the shelves wait empty and cardboard boxes stand open on the floor. Frederick sits at a glass top table at the back of the room, both table and boy looking small amid the clutter. His hair has been combed hard to one side, and his loose cotton shirt is bunched up beneath behind his shoulders so that his collar is skewed. His eyes do not rise to meet his visitors. He wears his same old black framed glasses. Someone has been feeding him the spoon rests on the glass table, and blobs of porridge cling to Frederick whiskers his place mat which is a woolen thing featuring happy pink-cheeked children and clogs. Werner cannot look at it. 
for any bends and pushes three more spoonfuls into Frederick's mouth and wipes his chin, folds up his placemat, and walks through a swinging door into what must be a kitchen. Warner stands with his hands crossed in front of his belt. One year. More than that. Frederick has to shave now, Warner realizes, or someone has to shave him. Hello, Frederick. Frederick rolls his head back and looks towards Warner through his smudged lenses down the line of his nose. I'm Warner. Your mother said you might not remember. I'm your friend from school. Frederick seems not so much to be looking at Warner as through him. On the table is a stack of paper on top of which a thick and clumsy spiral has been drawn by a heavy hand. Did you make this? Warner lifts the topmost drawing. Beneath that page is another, then another, thirty or four of these spirals, each taking up a whole sheet, all in the same severe lead. Frederick drops his chin to his chest, possibly a nod. Warner glances around the trunk, a box of linens, the pale blue of his walls and the rich white of the wainscot. Late sunlight glides through tall French windows in the air, taste of silver polish. This fifth floor apartment is indeed nice than the second floor one. The ceiling is high and decorated with punched tin and stucco flourishes, fruits, flowers, banana leaves. Frederick's lip is curled and his upper teeth show and a string of drool swings from his chin and touches the paper. Warner, unable to bear it a second longer, calls for the maid. Franny peeks out of the swinging door. Where, he asks, is that book, the one with the birds and the gold slipcover? I don't think we ever had a book like that. No, you did. Franny only shakes her head and laces her fingers across her apron. Werner lifts the flaps of boxes, peering in. Surely it's around here. Frederick has begun to draw a new spiral on a blank sheet. Maybe in this. Franny stands beside Werner and plucks his wrist off the crate he's about to open. I do not think, she repeats, we ever had a book like that. Werner's whole body has started to itch. Out the huge windows, the lindens toss back and forth. The light fades. An unlit sign atop a building two blocks away reads, Berlin smokes Junos. Franny has already retreated back into the kitchen. Werner watches Frederick create another crude spiral with a pencil locked in his fist. I'm leaving Schubforte, Frederick. They're changing my age and sending me to the front. Frederick lifts the pencil, studying, then reapplying it. Less than a week, Frederick works his mouth as if to say, You look pretty, he says. He does not look directly at Werner, and his words are close to more. You look pretty. Very pretty, mama. I'm not your mama, hisses Werner. Come on now. Frederick's expression is entirely without artifice. Somewhere in the kitchen, the maid is listening. There's no other sound. Not of traffic or airplanes or trains or radios with a specter of Frau Schwarzenberg's rattling the cage of the elevator. No chanting, no singing, no silk banners, no bands, no trumpets, no mother, no father, no slick-fingered commandant dragging a finger across his back. The city seems utterly still as though everyone is listening, waiting for someone to slip. Werner looks at the blue of the walls and thinks of birds of America, yellow-crowned heron, Kentucky warbler, scarlet tanager, birds after glorious bird, and Frederick Gaze remains stuck in some terrible mill ground, each eye a stagnant pool in which Werner cannot bear to look. Or could relapse. In late June 1942, for the first time since her fever, fever Madame Manic is not in the kitchen when Marie Laura wakes. Could she already be at the market? Marie Laura taps on her door, waits a hundred heartbeats. She opens the rear door and calls into the alley. Glorious warm June dawns, pigeons and cats screech of laughter from a neighboring window. Madam, her heart accelerates. She taps again on Madame Manic's door. Madam? When she lets herself in, she hears the rattle first, as though a weary tide stirs stones in the old woman's lungs. Sour odors of sweat and urine rise from the bed. Her hand finds Madame's face. The old woman's cheek is so hot that Marie Laura's finger recoils as though scalded. She scrambled upstairs, stumbling, shouting, Uncle, Uncle, the whole house turning scarlet in her mind, roof turning to smoke, flames chewing through walls. Etienne crouches on his popping knees beside Madame, then scurries to the telephone and speaks a few words. He returns to Madame Manic's bedside at a trot. Over the next hour, the kitchen fills with women. Madame Real, Madame Fontenelle, Madame Hebrad. The first floor becomes too crowded. Marie Laura paces the staircase up and down, up and down, as though working her way up and down the spire of an enormous seashell. The doctor comes and goes. The occasional woman closes her bony hand around Marie Laura's shoulder as exactly, and at exactly two o'clock, by the bonging of the cathedral bells, the doctor returns with a man who says nothing beyond good afternoon, who smells of dirt and clover, who lifts Madame Manic and carries her out on to, into the street, sets her on a horse cart as though she is a bag of milled oats, and the horse's shoes clop away, and the doctor strips the bed sheets, and Marie Laura finds Etienne in the corner of the kitchen, whispering, Madame is dead. Madame is dead. Okay, well, before we embark on this last bit of journey that I have for you tonight, just want to let you know I love you, and if you didn't make it this far, it's been a while, so I hope you're buckled up, because we have, like, five more pages left or something along those lines. Okay, and here we go back into the story. Six. 8th of August, 1944. Someone in the house. A presence. An inhalation. Marie Laura trains all her senses on the entryway three fights below. 
the outer gate sighs shut, then the front door closes. In her head, her father reasons, the gate closed before the door, not after, which means whoever it is, he closed the gate first, then shut the door. He's inside. All the hairs on the back of her neck stand up. Etienne knows he would have triggered the bell, Marie. Etienne will be calling for you already. Boots in the foyer. Fragments of dishes crunching underfoot. It's not Etienne. The distress is so acute it is almost unbearable. She tries to settle her mind, tries to focus on an Im image of a candle flame burning at the center of her ribcage, a snail drawn up into the coils of its shell, but her heart bangs in her chest and pulses a fierce cycle up her spine, and she is subtly uncertain whether a sighted person in the foyer can look up at the curves of the stairwell and see all of the way to the third floor. She remembers her great uncle said that they would need to change out for looters, watch out for looters, and the air stirs with phantom blurs and rustles. And Marie Laura imagines charging past the bathroom into the cobweb sewing room here on the third floor and hur hurling herself out the window. Boots in the hall, the slide of a dish across the floor as it is kicked. A fireman, a neighbor, some German soldier hunting food. A rescuer would be calling for survivors, ma chérie. You have to move, you have to hide. The footfalls travel toward Madame Mannix's room. They go slowly, maybe it's dark. Could it already be my night? Four or five or six or a million heartbeats roll by. She has her cane, Etienne's coat, two cans, the knife, the brick. Model house and her dress pocket. The stone inside that, watered in the tub at the end of the hall. Move. Go. A pot or pan presumably knocked off its hook and the bombing wobbles on the kitchen tiles. He exits the kitchen, returns to the foyer. Stand, Mashri. Stand up now. She stands with her right hand. She finds the railing. He's at the base of the stairs. She almost cries out, but then she recognizes. Just as she sets his foot on the first stair, that his stride is out of rhythm. One pause. Two. One pause. Two. This is a walk she has heard before. The limp of a German sergeant major with a dead voice. Go. Marie Laura takes each step as deliberately as she can, grateful now that she does not have her shoes. Her heart knocks so furiously against the cage of her chest that she feels certain the man below will hear it. Up to the fourth floor, each step a whisper. The fifth. On the sixth floor landing, she pauses beneath the chandelier and tries to listen. She hears the German climb three or four more steps and take a brief asthmatic pause. Then on again, a wooden step complains beneath his weight. Sounds to her like a small animal being crushed. He stops on what she believes the third floor landing, where she was just sitting, her warmth still there on the wood floor beside the telephone table, her dissipated breath. Where does she have left to run? Hide. To her left, which her grandfather's old room. To her right, which her little bedroom. The window, glass blown out. Straight ahead is the toilet, still the faint reek of smoke everywhere. His footfalls cross the landing. One pause. Two. One pause. Two. Wheezing. Climbing again. If it touches me, she thinks I will tear out his eyes. She opens the door to his grandfather's bedroom and stops. Below her, the man pauses again. Has he heard her? Is he climbing more quietly? Out in the world waits a multitude of sanctuaries, gardens full of bright green wind, kingdoms of hedges, deep pools of forest shade through which butterflies float, thinking only of nectar. She can get to none of them. She finds the huge wardrobe at the far end of Henry's room and opens the two mirrored doors and parts of the old shirts hanging inside and slides open the false door. Etienne is built into its back. She squeezes into the tiny space where the ladder rises to the garret. Then she reaches back through the wardrobe, finds his door, and closes them. Protect me now, Stone. If you are a protector, silently, says the voice of her father, make no noise. With one hand, she finds the handle Etienne has raked onto the false panel on the back of the wardrobe. She glides it shut, one centimeter at a time, until she hears it click into place, then takes a breath and holds it for as long as she can. The death of Walter burned. For an hour, burned murmured English, gibberish. Then he went silent, and Volkheimer said, God have mercy on your soul, servant. But now Byrne sits up and calls for light. They feed him the last of the water in the first canteen. A single thread of it runs down through his whisker and Werner watches it go. Byrne sits in the glimmer of the field light and looks for Volkheimer to warm her. On leave last year, he says, I visited my father. He was old. He was old all my life, but now he seemed especially old. It took him forever just to cross his kitchen. He had a package of cookies, little almond cookies. He put them out on a plate, just the package lying crosswise. Neither of us ate any, he said. You don't have to stay. I'd like you to stay, but you don't have to. You probably have things to do. You can go off with your friends if you want to. He kept saying that. Volkheimer switches off the light and Werner apprehends something excruciatingly held at bay there in the darkness. I left, says Byrne. I went down the stairs into the street. I had nowhere to go. Nobody to see. I didn't have any friends in that town. I had ridden trains all goddamn day to see him, but I left. Just like that. Then he's quiet. Volkheimer repositions him on the floor with Werner's blanket over him. And not long afterward, Byrne dies. Werner works on the radio. Maybe he does it for you to, as Volkheimer suggested. Or maybe he does it so he does not have to think about Volkheimer carrying Byrne into a corner and piling bricks onto his hands, his chest, his face. Werner holds the field light in his mouth and gathers what he can. A small hammer, three jars of screws, 18-gauge line cord from a shattered desk lamp. Inside a warped cabinet drawer, and miraculously, he discovers a zinc carbon 11-volt battery with a black cat print on the side. An American battery, its slogan offering nine lives. Werner spotlights it. 
in the flickering orange glow. Amazed, he checks his terminal. Still plenty of charge. When the field light battery dies, he thinks we'll have this. He writes the capsized table. It says the crushed transceiver on top. Warner does not yet believe there is much promise in it, but maybe it's enough to give the mind something to do, a problem to solve. He adjusts full cameras, lightens teeth, tries not to think about hunger or thirst. They stop her. The stoppered void in his left ear burned in the corner. The Austrians upstairs. Frederick, Frau Lena, Yuda, any of it. Antenna, tuner, capacitor, his mind while he works is almost quiet, almost calm. This is an act of memory. Sixth floor bedroom. Von Rumpel limps through the rooms with their faded white moldings and ancient kerosene lamps and embroidered curtains and ball epoch meter mirrors and ships and glass bottles and push buttons. Electrical switches all dead. Faint twilight angles through smoke and shutter slats and heavy hazy red stripes. Temple to the Second Empire of this house. A bathtub, three quarters full of cold water on the third floor. Deeply cluttered rooms on the fourth. No doll houses yet. He climbs to the fifth floor, sweating, worrying he got everything wrong. The weight in his gut swings pendulously. Here's a, a large ornate room crammed with trinkets and crates and books and mechanical parts. A desk, a bed, a divan. Three windows on each side. No model. To the sixth floor. On the left, a tidy bedroom with a single window and long curtain. A boy's cap hangs on the wall. At the back looms a massive wardrobe. Moth bald shirts hung inside. Back to the landing. Here's a little water closet, the toilet full of urine. Beyond it, a final bedroom. Seashells are lined along every final available surface. Shells on the sills and on the dressers, and jars full of pebbles lined upon the floor. All arranged by some indiscernible system. And here, here, here on the floor at the foot of the beds is what he has been searching for. A wooden model of the city, nestled like a gift as big as a dining table. Brimming with tiny houses, except for flakes of plaster and streets, the little city is entirely undamaged. The simulacrum, now more whole than the original, a work of queer magnificence. In the daughter's room, for her, of course. Von Rumpel feels as if he has come triumphantly to the end of a long journey, and as he sits on the edge of the bed, twin flares of pain riding up from his groin. He has the curious sensation of having been here before, of having lived in a room like this, slept in a lumpy bed like this, collected polished stones and arranged them like this. As if somehow this whole set has been waiting for his return. He thinks of his own daughters, how much they would love to see a city on a table. His youngest would want him to kneel beside her. Let's imagine all the people having their supper, she'd say. Let's imagine us, Papa. Outside the broken window, outside the latch shutters, St. Mollo's so quiet that Von Rumpel can hear the rustle of his own heartbeat shifting hairs in his inner ear. Smoke blowing all over the roof, ash falling lightly. Any moment the guns will start again. Gently now, it will be in here somewhere. It is just the locksmith to repeat himself, the model. It will be inside the model. Making the radio. One end of wire Werner crimps around a shorn pipe, standing dry, diagonally up from the floor. With spit, he wipes clean the length of the wire and coils it a hundred times around the base of the pipe, making a new tuning coil. The other end, he slings through a bent strut wedged into the congestion of timber, stone, and plaster that has become their ceiling. Volkheimer watches from the shadows. A mortar shell explodes somewhere in the city, and a flurry of dust sifts down. The diode goes between free ends of the two wires and meets the lids of the battery to complete the circuit. Werner runs the beam of Volkheimer's light over the entire operation, ground, antenna, battery. Finally, he braces the flashlight between his teeth and raises the twin leads of an earphone in front of his eyes and strips them against the threads of a screw and touches the naked ends to a diode. Invisibly, electrons bumble down the wires. The hotel above them, what is left of it, makes a series of unearthly groans, timber splinters, as though the rubble teeters on some final fulcrum, as though a single dragonfly could alight on it and trigger an avalanche that will bury them for good. Werner presses the butt of the earphone into his right ear. It does not work. He turns over the dented radio case, peers into it, wraps Volkheimer's fading light back to life, settle the mind, and envision the distribution of current. He rechecks the fuses, valves, plug pins. He toggles the receive slash send switch, blows dust off the meter selector, replaces the LEDs to the battery, tries the earphone again, and there it is. As if he is eight years old again, crouched beside his sister on the floor of children's house, static, rich and steady. In his memory, Yuta says his name, and on its tail comes a second less expected image, twin ropes strung from the front of Er Seidler's house, the great smooth crimson banner hanging from them, unsoiled, deeply red. Werner scans frequencies by feel. No squelch, no snap of Morse code, no voices. Static, 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 static. In his functioning ear, in the radio, in the air, Volkheimer's eyes stay on him. Dust floats at the feeble beam of the flashlights. Ten thousand particles turning softly, twinkling. <clears throat> in the attic, the German shuts the wardrobe doors and hobbles away, and Marie Lore stays in the bottom rung of the ladder for his count of forty, sixty, one hundred. The heart scrambling to deliver oxygenated blood, the mind scrambling to unravel the situation. A sentence ETN once read it aloud returns. Even the heart, which in the higher animals, when agitated, pulsates with increased energy 
and a snail in a similar excitement throbs with a slower motion. Slow the heart, flex your feet, make no sound. She presses her ear to the false panel in the back of the wardrobe. What does she hear? Moths gnawing away at her grandfather's ancient smocks. Nothing. Slowly and possibly, Marie Laura finds herself growing sleepy. She feels for the cans in her pockets. How to open one now, without making noise. Only thing to do is climb. Seven rungs up into the long triangular tunnel of the garret. The raw timbered ceiling rises on both sides toward the peak, just higher than the top of her head. Heat has lodged itself up here. No window, no exit, nowhere else to run. No way out except the way she has come. Her outstretched fingers fold, find an old shaving bow, an umbrella stand, and a crate full of who knows what. The attic floorboards beneath her feet are as wide across her hands. She knows from experience how much noise a person walking on them makes. Don't knock anything over. If the German opens the wardrobe again and yanks aside the hand clothes and squeezes through the door and climbs up into the attic, what will she do? Knock him on the head of the umbrella? Stand? Jab him with the paring knife? Scream? Die? Papa? She crawls along the center beam from which the narrow planks of flooring emanate toward the stone bulk of the chimney at the far end. The center beam is thickest and will be quieter. She hopes she has not become disoriented. She hopes he is not behind her, leveling a pistol at her back. Bats cry almost inaudibly at the attic vent in somewhere far away. On a naval ship, perhaps, or way out past Param, a heavy gun fires. Crack. Pause. Crack. Pause. Then the long scream as a shell comes flying in the thump as it explodes on an outer island. A ghastly, creeping terror rises from a pace beyond thoughts. Some innermost trap door she must leap upon immediately and lean against with our weight and padlock shut. She takes off the coat and spreads it across the floor. She dares not pull herself up for fear of the noise her knees will make on the boards. Time passes. Nothing from downstairs. Could he have gone? So quickly? Of course he is not gone. She knows, after all, why he is here. To her left, several electrical cords wind along the floor. Just ahead is Etienne's box of old records, his wind-up Victrola, his old recording machine, the lever he used to hoist the aerial along the side of the chimney. She hugs her knees to her chest and tries to breathe through her skin, soundlessly, like a snail. She has the two cans, the brick, the knife. Okay, well, there we go. At the end of number six. If you've made it this far, it has been incredibly long, so I hope it's not too late for you, but I love you so, so, so much, and I hope you find this useful and enjoyable.